All right. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to In Class with Car, episode 79. 79. 79. We are here. 79. 79. Yeah. Okay. We, we blew through our golden anniversary. We blew through the diamond. We went through 50 and 75. But you know, we're here. All of those uh, commemorations, I think there is important to pause and sit in a space, which we're going to do today, and remember and uh, pay homage to the work that has been done and the things that have happened, you know, but the work is ahead of us. This is more work. That's right. And, and before we get started, first of all, this is the first time ever that we are broadcasting an, a live Saturday class in Nubia for the first time. Oh, uh, so Nubians, uh, hello, welcome. And if you are a member of Narrative, and you want to watch it on your laptop or computer, you go to community.narrative.com and you can see it all in its splendor in class. If you have the app, you download the app, Android, iOS. It is not for tablets. So if you want the tablet view, go to your computer, community.nubia.com. Download the app. Use the exact same username and password for narrative. Nubia is part of narrative. So if you have signed up for narrative, you have now everyone is official. Today is Nubia's official birthday. Wow. Wow. Because you know, you want you want the day to not just be about somber uh commemorations, but also yeah. celebrations. So we're gonna yeah. celebrate the birth of Nubia today. Uh so if you're a member of narrative, you are now also officially a member of Nubia. And shout out to the wonderful help team in Ghana because they spent the last couple of weeks integrating manually every narrative member into Nubia so that your username for narrative and password will work. So all those thousands of people. Yes. Uh they did a oh my God. This team, I'm so happy with the people, you yeah. know, who have uh participated in this, Carl, Uraeus, Ahmad, Kareem, Donica, Jamal. Yeah. I mean it's just just an amazing team. And this team in Africa in, in Ghana, uh headed up by Angie Dadson, they are Oh, they are amazing. And uh, truly, just, you know, global. truly global. Yes, 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 yes. And we have a team in the Netherlands headed up by a black woman um, as well, working on the business side. So like, yeah, this is this is turning into a thing that um, I always imagined it would be, but I could not even imagine that it was going to be all of this. So and it's only because of the people. Oh, it's because of the people. I yeah. was talking with you raised this morning. And he was like, oh, it was Carl. Carl was talking with him. Uh, he was like this. This is taking on a life worth force of his own. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, it has. So thank it's you. Extremely, 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 just not only encouraging and inspiring, but instructive. This the, the, the work itself is teaching. And so even as we ask our folk who are not yet in narrative to smash the like button and drive the algorithms crazy on YouTube and get all that going, the thousands who come over the arc of the week and many who are here now, thousands who will be here today to do that. We also recognize that we are in uncharted territory in terms of the technology, but we are charting a path. And so this is teaching. You're teaching us, Professor Hunter, gathering these folks gathering all of us in and then saying we can build out the places we want to be in. Um, have you seen um, Concrete Cowboy on Netflix? Yes. Is that is that with Id Idris? Yes. Yes, I have. And I loved it, by the way. I don't know if you loved it, but I loved it. And, and just to piggyback on what you're saying, I didn't know what this was going to be. You know, you just have mm -hmm. a for something, right? You don't know if, but you have to try you have to set forth to do your vision. Even if you don't know where it's going to end up, you don't know if you're going to accomplish all of the things. But I have faith in a couple of things. I have faith in us. No question. Always. And Always also, been on black. And also, if, if you know, if everyone didn't buy into it, it's still fine because 100 years from now, the work is still valid and, and valuable and important. So I, I thought about it. If we just do this for the future people, I'm still good. I think it's still it's still very very important. So I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. We're um, going to be here. I mean, it's funny. Uh, last night um, I was in a long conversation. Shout out to my family in Chicago, the Comedic Institute. They have a series there where they do film screenings and talkbacks and conversations. And we had a conversation. That's why, when, as you were talking, I was thinking about the Concrete Cowboys because you know, I, you know, I'm a, I'm an adopted Philadelphian. They let me uh, claim Philly since I lived there as long as I did. And I still back, I'm still back and forth with them, particularly with freedom schools. And when you see that, that uh, as Idris Elba says about that film, Conquer, uh, 
Concrete Cowboy, you know, it, he didn't know necessarily where the movie started and where the documentary stopped. Because so many of the people in there, the young sister, the elders, the old head, the cat in the wheelchair, a lot of those, you know, for even the brother who played the kind of cat who was on the other side of the law, who put the hit out on, on Cole's brother. Yeah. Was yeah. In, um, he won an Emmy for When They See Us. Young, yes. young conscious, beautiful yeah. Jarrell. Lord have mercy. That brother. Yes. Yes. I mean, it was so, you know, and it's so funny. You know that it resonates when people who are from a place say, okay, yeah, that's cool. And a lot of people, there were a lot of Philadelphians in because, of course, with this technology, we can have people from everywhere. And they co-signed. In fact, we had a couple of the brothers. We had the brother who was uh, Idris Elba's dialect coach. And we laughed about it. I said, I knew you must have some. He must have had somebody good because y'all didn't mess John up. You know, there's a when you say John in Philadelphia, it's different than Baltimore and D.C. John. That's a whole nother thing. And so uh, anyway, I set out to say that, you know, the horse culture of black people um, in the Western Hemisphere, particularly the United States, is something that is everywhere. And we talked a lot about that. A lot of elders, it was an elder, Harold Pates, but one of our great educators who is now between LA and Chicago, who grew up in Chicago, he talked about the ice man and the rag man and all the people who had the horse drawn, you know, equipment back in the day, Larry Crow, who interviewed Ida B. Wells, ice boy, whose horse knew the ice route so well. He interviewed him years ago. He was like 103 at the time Larry interviewed him. And Larry said, the elder told me, he said, when I was a kid, I delivered Ida B. Wells ice and I had that horse. And he said the horse would move from stop to stop just as I would get back to the wagon. And when we got to the end of the line, the horse would turn around and go back toward the stable without me having to do anything. I mean, the horse knew the way better than <laughs> than I did. But I still have to say that when you see Concrete Cowboy, you're seeing people who have kept something alive that was part of the economy of these cities. I mean, I was rereading. In fact, I was talking about Compton Cowboy. We talked about this one a little bit. This is, of course, the. Uh, the uh, the brothers and sisters who are out in Compton, of course, and they go back decades as well. Um, but I, I said all that to say that, of course, we see though that 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 movie, which is really the conversation we had last night, and uh, shout out to Kam Kamal Rashid and Yvonne Jones, all the people at KI, um, we were talking about the impact of gentrification, colonization, really, and. The fact that the Philly folks, Cobbs Creek, uh, the area around Fairmont Park, Strawberry Mansion, what they call them. I lived probably about 10 minutes from there. So I would see those cats at like four day in the morning, early in the morning. Maybe they, sometimes they ride the, the horses down the middle of the street and uh, right around the corner from John Coltrane's house. Where we know the main character, the young man is named for John Coltrane. He finds out in the movie. That's who he's named for. But the fact of the matter is that there is an impermanence, um, an, an instability, a placelessness of sorts that 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 dogs that haunts African people in the Western Hemisphere in the United States. And so even though right now um, that particular horse club has stable club has ownership of the stables the horses are in directly across the street. The city of Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Housing Authority and the Philadelphia Land Bank has started constructing housing, senior housing, which is what we need more senior housing everywhere. But the, Philadelphia is a big city. You could have put it somewhere else. Where do they choose to build? On the land where the horses graze right across the street where you see them racing and all that stuff. And, and I'm saying that to say that when you have community. And there's a line in the movie, you know, home is not a place. It's your people. It's where you are. That's absolutely true. But here's something that's also true. Place matters. Ownership matters. Control matters because all of that comes with a sense of permanence. Now, we know there's nothing permanent in reality. Everything is in a constant stage of transition, constant stage of change. But in our ability to perceive in this short time between physical birth and physical death, we have place. And, you know, Nubia is a place. It isn't just a place on the continent of Africa, one of the birthplaces of human civilization. It's now a place where that we have, we control, we have conversations. And so as folks are chatting here live and on the YouTube side, in Nubia, there's a whole nother conversation that's compiling. And guess what? You can't just come in this place. Now you can join, but you have to join. And that's something that that is very important as we pause here on uh, the 11th of September, 2021. 
when the United States is uh, engaged in a moment of ritual um, creation, identity creation. You can call it commemoration. You can call it pausing to acknowledge. But really what what anniversaries do, like birthdays or holidays or any other, they're really reinforcing a sense of community. And that sense of community in our terms of our birthdays is real. That's the day we came out of our mother's womb. In a sense of something like September 11, 2001, it is a it is a fiction. And that fiction doesn't mean it doesn't have real world impact. But I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, this is an important birthday here for, for, for Nubian narrative. But, but I'm just thinking about that because those horses have a place until they don't. And when you can't control where you are, they tear your stuff down. Now, next thing, where are you going to ride them horses out? Where are you going to put them horses out? Well, I guess, you know, no. If they decide to put the hammer down on y'all and take them horses, there's nothing you can do. And that should speak to the impermanence of blackness. And we should always be concerned about the fact that if we don't control it, at some point, you turn off the master switch. <laughs> We're experiencing that at Howard this week, but that's a whole nother story for another. Yes, go ahead, Professor. Is it though? Is it though? Because uh, I think it is a discussion for today. As I was hmm. watching, um, I was doing two things this morning. Uh, watch Blood Brothers, which we'll talk about in a second. But also, hmm. I was watching. You know, I got up with the you know the time because we all remember where we were twenty years ago. Um, you know, it was a beautiful day, and I remember exactly what I was doing. I know you probably remember. I was talking to my class. Many of them weren't even born. You know, some some weren't even born yet. And I was like, how is that possible? Oh, yeah. OK, I'm old. <laughs> it's like it's weird. No, no, a quarter. In fact, about 25 percent of the people who live in the United States today were not born before September. They were not alive on September the 11th, 2001. They were still on the answer. They were still on the other side. A quarter, 25 percent. That ain't counting all the people too young to remember. Just right. people who weren't born. <laughs> you know, I have, I have a young lady from China and mm. they they actually in China played a documentary when she was in school before she came here. Mm. And they they talked about it. I thought that was interesting. I had a young lady from, I want to say Peru. Uh, they didn't play anything about 9-11 in Peru. She didn't know anything until she came here. Well, there's more important 9-11 in uh, Latin America that we're also going to talk about today. But yes, uh, that may be one reason. All right. I mean, but it was interesting to, to listen um, to the emotion. And then I caught myself humming, God bless America. And I was like, what are you doing? Did you? Yes, I, I caught myself doing it, Dr. Carr. I got caught in the social structure for a split second. And I realized that for the governance structure to today means something different, especially now with perspective, right? For us. And one of my students talked about imperialism in class. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh. Um, okay, young lady, what are we, where are you going? Can we go there? You know, and yes, we can. And so went there. we went there. Okay. Uh, the students were school. You know, squirming a little bit, but we went, uh, because <laughs> it's you know, delicate. I asked the question. You know, the impact of that day. We we talk about it, but we don't talk about the why and the how. We don't talk about the history. We don't talk about what did Iraq and Afghanistan have to do with it, and why were we in war with them? And we didn't talk about the squandered goodwill because if they were doing talking about it in China twenty years ago, and they were That's on right. that day. That's right. What happened since that eroded the, the sense of national unity around something horrific that happened? Was, to there, was there national unity? Mm. And so, oh, so I wanted to bring this up because I in, in watching some yeah. of the um discussions. Um, do you, you know uh J J, I guess J E H is that pronounced J or Ja? J Johnson. J Johnson. J. J. Johnson, J. Johnson granddaddy was Charles Johnson, who developed oh, the uh, social science institute at Fisk. J. Johnson's grandfather. Uh, Charles Johnson was the brother who worked with Ophelia Settle Egypt that did those narratives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's his granddaddy. How far has the actual following from? Anyway, I, don't know, go ahead. I, I don't know why I honed in on him, but I did. Um, mm -hmm. was having a conversation about that day and and how you know he was in his law firm and look and then that day got him off his couch to get involved and and create uh, what we now know is the Department of Home, uh, Def Homeland Security or what have you. And uh, he was the general counsel of the Department of Defense during the Obama administration. Uh, and his mom, since you want to bring up his lineage, is, was worked for the plant, worked for Planned Parenthood, his mother, yeah. Norma. Yeah. Uh, so he was born September 11th, 1957. Just today is his birthday. And there are a lot of people celebrating their birthday. So I want to also wish everyone a happy uh, Earth Day, born happy today, ha happy trip around the sun. Um, and your day should not be muddied by the, the backdrop of this. Celebrate yourself uh, in this time. Oh, no, no. 
but I was thinking, he said some things about, he said, I, I don't think, he said, today's war is, you know, infrastructure, climate change, cybersecurity. And I thought about what was going on in Howard, uh, how, you know, ransomware can shut down a university's, um, university. for, you know, and then he said divisions in America. He said, if, if 9-11 were to happen today, I don't think that America would would come together uh, to to do anything against it. There would be division, much the way we see really? the handling of this pandemic. He said that out of his mouth, and I was like, "Oh, why would he?" I wonder why he would say that, particularly since he's had privy. He's been in the control center for the federal apparatus that has destabilized governments around the world, including Libya. Shout out to Jay Johnson, okay. um, Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama. So why would he? Jay Johnson understands nationalism better. A lot of nationalism is fear. And what we saw, in fact, let me ask you this question, Professor. It's just very quick. Um, that day, uh, were you were you over the were you across the bridge? Or where, where were you? No, no, I was I was I was in Jersey. Okay. In Orange. Uh, I was uh, working on my column. I was a columnist at the time for the New York Daily News, so I was working on a column that was due uh, the next day or the day after. And I had the TV on. It was, you know, I got up early because I got up, you know, I get up early and I, I was working and I looked, I saw the first plane on the television. I was like, that's, what, you know, what's what's going on? The second plane, I knew that this was on purpose, the second one. And then, you know, just watching the coverage after that. And then, of course, my column shifted from what I was writing about. And I don't even remember. It must have been an education piece because I was that was uh, my primary uh, focus. Yeah, I was. I remember exactly where I was, and I was not in New York City, but I did try to go to the bank that day and couldn't get money. I remember that well, day. in Jersey. Yes, I remember the bank. Oh, sure, they could shut every. Yes, thing. I was like, no, what ATM? Give me my money. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I had just finished. Um, I just dropped my girlfriend off, uh, girlfriend at the time off at Community College of Philadelphia. She was finishing. We were all in grad school at the time. Well, I had finished. Actually, I was working for the school district at the time, Philadelphia. And um, we had no, 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 no. 2001, I was at Howard by then, but I wasn't in D.C. that day because I lived in Philly for about 10 years before I finally moved down this way. And I had the radio on and one of the legends of Philadelphia news broadcasting uh, assistant whose uh, radio name was Mary Mason. I think she's still alive. She had a, a show called Mornings with Mary and W.H.A.T. at the time, AM talk radio, black talk radio. and I was listening to her and she said, you know, it looks like some kind of plane hit the World Trade Center. What? And then she's talking to me. And then I got a call from my girlfriend's mother. They were, she was in Atlanta. I said, I said, no, everything's fine. Wait, why are you calling? Do you watch TV? No. Well, hold on. Wait a minute. So I went back to the house, turned on television. And that's when I saw. So I went back, picked her up, you know, brought her back. And then we just did like everybody else, I guess, watching, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Except that night, um, I got in the car and tried to get to New York because I wanted to see it. And I took Route One. You know, I'm cheap anyway. I don't like getting on that thing in the toes. You know, I'm, I'm Route One guy all the way. <laughs> Philly to Trenton, 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 Trenton to Brunswick, Brunswick across the hell. Yeah, I ain't paying no toes anyway. But. <laughs> I, we got as far. I think we got past Brunswick, and so now, as you know, you know, you know them roads. We getting close to where you are. Right? We getting over, there, and we couldn't get any closer. Plus, I knew I wasn't going to be able to get a copy of the New York Times the next morning. So pause, I would just pause, pause for a second. You got in your car on nine eleven, yeah, and drove up absolutely on to go to New York because you wanted you I wanted to see it. You want to see it with your own eyes. No question. Because, see, this is the thing. The, the United States of America is not a nation, y'all. I know we want it to be. This is why I'm a little surprised at Jay Johnson. The people who, the firefighters, the first responders, the police, all the security, the guards, the people who worked in the buildings. And if you all have watched, been watching Spike Lee's uh, documentary that's been coming out on Home Bus Office, you really get a sense of the, the full range of people. The people, the boat owners who showed up in lower Manhattan and, and, and transported tens of thousands of people across the lower Hudson. Um, those people banded together around survival. 
They're not singing God Bless America or the Star Spangled Band. They're saying you're hurt, you're in the street, you're covered in dust, or somebody just fell out the sky. What the hell is going on? Come on, let's go. Because they work together. Or they didn't even know each other. I'm, I'm opening the door to the deli as the smoke is blowing through the alley. Y'all come on in here. I mean, this is about human beings. Now it gets narrated as patriotism. Ain't nothing to do with patriotism. Because there were a lot of people who lost their lives that day who didn't even have green cards, documents. Because anybody who's ever lived in or been around a major city, particularly New York City, understands that a lot of undocumented people make their, made their living in lower Manhattan. And a lot of those people died on that day. And so, you know, you're trying to, I mean, if you've ever ridden the subway in New York, you know, it's people out there trying to make a, you know, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cent, asking for money, playing music. A lot of people died. But the thing was, what 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 emerged that day was what would emerge in just about any other circumstance like that. Our common humanity. Mm -hmm. We are being attacked. But the we being attacked is humanity. And so, I mean, and as you all know, you, you, you I mean, you've lived in that this region your whole life. How many people who saved people? were Sikhs who are not even Muslim, but had their hand, they oh. hand wrapped up. Ain't nobody asking them, are you a Muslim? Do you have a Quran? In it? Come on, come on, let's go over here. I mean, cops who would beat your ass that morning were helping black people or black people were helping cops. This had nothing to do with a flag. This is like, this is raining fire. <laughs> you know what I'm come on. But that will get narrated as America. This And let me, let me tell you, come on back here because I want to ask you about this. This is what I want to ask you. This is really where I was going with this one. Yeah. New York City, for the first time in my living memory, and maybe in yours, I think New York City became part of the rest of the country. It didn't last. Right. And that's what I was going to say. You know, the, the galvanizing factor was humanity. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why China could lean in because it was humanity. If it could happen to America, it could happen anywhere, all over the globe. And we squandered that really quickly. We squandered that sense of... Hmm, I mean, you mean you mean human beings? No, you're right. Uh, I'm asking George Bush and them. How well, no, no, they didn't squander it at all. They took the opportunity to pass uh, a great deal of legislation that turned torture into legal uh, stuff. Hunted Muslims, including Black Muslims, uh, unleashed the federal security state, which is why I'm surprised Jay Johnson mm. would say, "Jay Johnson, you were in charge of this, bruh. Y'all took this out, and no, it wasn't me. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was Condoleezza Rice. We're gonna talk about what happened in the days leading up to September, the week before. Your friend Condoleezza Rice, your friend Colin Powell." I remember Colin Powell, because what happened September the 1st, September 11, 2001, that happens. Two years later, Colin Powell asked at the UN, shaking a vial of chalk, talking about this is what Saddam, dude, why you got that dust in a vial? Because y'all about to attack Iraq. No, they did not miss an opportunity at all. They took full advantage of an opportunity to start wars that we still trying to get out of that they didn't go fight. So no, I think they took full advantage. So who is the we? Okay, <laughs> I, I said corrected. Um, I also have a student in my class who's from Morocco, and mm -hmm. her she was she didn't she wasn't born, but her mother talks about having to take off her hijab and being afraid for her life uh, in the days after 9-11 because you know oh they're practicing Muslim and Sikhs. Those same Sikhs who are not necessarily Muslims, right? Who are being beaten and killed, you know, who are out there rolling up their sleeves, getting busy. Those warriors. Uh, because they look Muslim, uh, you know, the thing turned really quickly, which is what I wanted to leave. <laughs> September the 12th. Yes. Uh, with what <laughs> Johnson was saying. And, and here we are today. Can't even come together around a virus that is attacking all of us. But anyway, well, the, vi the virus didn't hit no buildings. Mm. See, the vi I mean, the virus is slow death and the virus allows the reality that this is not a country to be exposed, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a painful thing. It's a terrible thing for the sick for those who have lost their lives. And we don't celebrate any of that at all. In fact, quite the opposite, it's a tragedy. However, um, it is revealing the fact that this isn't a nation and that people who live here, you would almost have to be attacked in a, in a, in a kind of rapid, right there confrontation moment like September 11, 2001 to come together. In fact, Again, you know, uh, going back to somebody we mentioned a few weeks ago, you know, a mortal technique. And I think about when in, in that song they did, Ben Laden didn't blow up the projects. He said, you know, um, 
if a, if a foreign army, if another people attack the hood tonight, it would be warfare from Harlem to Washington Heights. I wouldn't be fighting for uh, racist churches in the South. I'd be fighting to keep those people out. <laughs> in other words, he said, I wouldn't be fighting for white America's dream. I'd be fighting for my people's survival and self-esteem. <laughs> in other words, you ever looked at somebody that you ever clocked somebody that looked at you wrong or insulted your mom? I mean, in other words, this wasn't about Osama bin Laden. This was about get, let's survive. And then the next day, all of the hatreds began to refocus. So you got people saying, we got to make sure you're all right. We got to get you to the hospital. We got to get you out of here. And you got other people saying, let's go bomb. Okay, now that's that's the place I live. In other words, once you got clear of the explosion and the wreckage, you go start looking for, some, for somebody to fight. And that's when Bush and them seized on an opportunity to say, yeah, with Afghanistan and $3 trillion later. I'm sorry, $3 trillion is not the cost. I was looking at some numbers the other day. The estimate is somewhere between six and six and a half trillion dollars will have been spent over what happened uh, in the invasion of Afghanistan. And then two years later, Iraq, just in benefits and associated costs with the veterans. And those costs will peak somewhere around mid-century, around 2048 to 2050. Meaning what? All that money that could have been spent on actually creating a country, perhaps, social safety net. Shout out to that cold, blow, dry, cosplay, cold miner Joe Manchin, the wholly owned subsidiary of corporations, saying <laughs> that uh, $3.5 trillion is too much money. I'm going to sit on my houseboat now here in the Potomac in D.C. and do the bidding of my corporate masters in the oil and gas industry and other places. Yeah, well, you know, $3.5 trillion over 10 years don't even come close to matching the money that was spent overseas in wars that went in the pockets of contractors, that went in the, con in the, in the pockets of defense contractors, uh, 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 paramilitary people, other European countries, all this don't even come to match. But all that money could have been spent domestically so that black people and poor people, brown folk, many other people in this country, are worse off today than they were that morning of September the 11th, 2001. So I share Jay Johnson's concept of lament, but he knows and we know better than that. But I understand you got to cling to that dream, brother. But let's think about this a little bit. And, you know, let's think about where we were. And by we, I mean people who were alive September the 11th, 2001, in terms of where, and, and let's think about that in terms of the United States. There's a lot of people in here from all over the world. And we all know by we, I mean, those of us who live in the United States, we know y'all don't look at this the same way. Because guess what? Neither do most of us. Except in the social structure, you have to engage in a kind of street theater. So you had to be very careful about how you enter conversations like this, because again, this is the reason why we had to have some type of methodology, some type of apparatus that is that comes out of the Africana studies intellectual thrust over the last 50 plus years and since the late 60s in terms of formal Africana studies at the university level and K-12 level, and then all of the intellectual work and cultural identity and cultural work and, 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 and beingness that precedes it. We had to have a framework so we could have these conversations. Often when we talk in the street, we're talking about a social structure conversation. 9-11, people will say, hmm, yeah, it's tragedy. Don't say nothing else after that <laughs> because, <laughs> because the governance structure starts seeping out. And in a minute, we'll talk about it. As I said, I'm looking forward to this conversation as well because we both sat and you actually interviewed the director of Blood Brother. Black brothers. And I'm looking forward to that because, you know, and I understand now it was a very documentary ish uh, production. But of course, the producer was the producer of Blackish. So I understand it's documentary ish. <laughs> but at any rate, the <laughs> very documentary ish. It was Malcolm X ish. It was Muhammad Ali ish. It was, <laughs> it was very Blackish. But How about but, ish. Well, yeah, you know what? <laughs> now, okay. you know how, now you know how I use those three letters as it relates to black. Yeah, black no, actually, it's not. Well, see, that's what they want is the double entendre. That's right. Blackish. 
and it, it really it's like black ish. No, it ain't. It's blackish. It's the conventional usage, but you're right. Because it ain't blackish. No, no, you're right. That's exactly right. That's ex that is exactly right. Oh my God. See, this is what we love. See, that that's that way of knowing. That's that cultural meaning making in the Africana please. So, but in the governance structure, when we think of 9-11, something that Muhammad Ali represents, something that Malcolm X represented and represents the internationalization of our common humanity. Both Malcolm and, and, and Ali following the tradition of many others, countless others who overflow the artificial lines on a map. So when Malcolm, for example, and we'll continue in 9-11 for a second, we'll go back. When Malcolm talks about the chickens coming home to roost, and we've had that, that tiny thread narrative baked into our minds uh, now in terms of the journey of Malcolm as it relates to the Nation of Islam. They did it again in this documentary. Malcolm said the chickens come home to roost. Elijah Muhammad told him to be quiet. And that was the end. That was the breakup. Even the letter they flash in the documentary on Blood Brothers. If y'all watch that documentary, when they start highlighting pieces, pause it and read the whole letter. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the point is that they both were internationalists. So when Malcolm says, you know, I'm an old farm boy. We talked about him in Omaha, Nebraska, and then Michigan. You know, chickens coming home to roost don't make me sad. They make me glad. And they use that the press as a wedge and kind of keep harping on it. Well, you see, there was chickens coming home to roost narrative around September 11, 2001. But that's not a conversation you can have using that language in the social structure. But neither is the, the social structure is quite aware that that is a conversation that was being had in the various governance structures of the people who live in the country we call the United States. It's one of the reasons that Jay Johnson's predecessors in the federal apparatus extended the security state, including heightened surveillance, including uh, wiretap warrants. Again, the Patriot Act comes in the wake of 9-11, 2000. They can just listen to people. And so you combine that with stereotyping people and you getting wiretaps based on cultural uh, racism and all kind of other things, you know, so you can just listen to people and you're checking to hear if people are talking like that. And then you suspect them of being terrorists. Meanwhile, the domestic terrorists emboldened by the idea that they can just now call anybody who's a Muslim or anybody who they think is a Muslim, a towel head or a rag head, they get in all kind of high tech weaponry in your military. And now they're they now they when they storm your capital on January the 6th, 2021, you're shocked. Shocked. <laughs> no, those people, those are the same people you was feeding on September the 11th, 2001 and cheering. And then they then they drew messages on the bombs that you dropped in Afghanistan. Come on now. This is white nationalism. But Black nationalism in America has almost always been black internationalism. There's a there's a nativist strain. That's a whole nother conversation. But anyway, let me get too deep into the weeds. And let me let me just get to the point. September 11, 2001. What had happened just before that? The end of August. This was the end of August 2001. August the 31st, 2001. From August the 31st, 2001 to September the 8th of that year, three days before the attack on the World Trade, World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the flight in, in Pennsylvania that crashed, uh, the one that they said the passengers took over. But if you watch Spike Lee's documentary, you hear different voices. And one and, and plus, it was very interesting. I don't know if you saw all of this group called the Soul Patrol. These are all the black people who worked on United Airplanes, the pilots, the flight attendants, the pole in the air. And they got these brothers and sisters who lost somebody on that flight. Um, 93, is it? The United Air that was in Pennsylvania? Yes. And the brother is like, because you hear, they actually, it was spiking them play a recording of the one of the sisters who was a flight attendant there saying goodbye to her children. It's quite, it's, it's very moving. But the brother is like, yeah, I don't think that they, I think their plane was shot down. Because then you also hear the flight controllers calling for intervention scramble the military jets so the idea and because then he's because what the flight attendant is like you know we look at it and then he, he, he talks to different people you know he's saying you know when you look at what left was left of the plane on the ground the crash 
air. I think that plane is probably shot out the sky. But let's not even get into that because they done made movies where the passengers attacked the terrorists. And, and that's really all that's important. Because again, these, these anniversaries are about creating identity. The heroic, patriotic, sacrifice themselves so that the plane wouldn't crash into the Capitol because they all knew where it was going. Passengers. OK, fine. Let's not even argue about that, because, again, that is a form of movement and memory. That's what anniversaries are. That's why these categories are we created them for Africana studies, but they apply to any form of human society. So movement and memory, that's really what anniversaries are there, too. So you, you, the myth making is there now. You're not going to reverse that. So from the 31st of August to the 8th of September 2001. There was a conference held under the auspices of the United Nations. In fact, 2001, according to the United Nations, was the international year of mobilization against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related uh, intolerance. So end of August, first week of September, the World Conference Against Racism was held in Durban, South Africa. Now, wh why is that important? There was a big debate in the Bush administration. Oh, pause. The Bush administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one that Bush got to be president because his brother and them were able to stop the counting of the votes in Florida. And the Supreme Court gave the election in Bush versus Gore to George Bush by stopping the count, intervening in a state action and saying in the on the first page of Bush v. Gore that this case shouldn't be cited as precedent in future cases, <laughs> which was stunning. So anyway, remember September the 10th, it's a whole nother conversation in this country, but let's go back over to South Africa. That Bush administration is there and the Bush administration had appointed, thinking about Jay Johnson again and the Obama administration, high ranking official with Susan Rice and others. Uh, they were preceded by the Bush administration's appointment of the first black secretary of state. What was that guy's name? Um, <laughs> Jamaican dude, I'm trying to think. Went to Bronx High School of Science, same place Sorty Carmichael. Uh, oh, Colin Powell, yeah. Colin Powell wanted to go to the World Conference Against Racism. But there was another sister from Birmingham, Alabama, whose daddy was uh, worked in administration at the segregated high school in Birmingham, um, along with Alma Powell's father. Colin Powell's father and Condoleezza Rice's daddy worked at the same segregated high school in Birmingham. Story for another day. Um, oh, Connelly's Rice, right, exactly. Connelly's Rice, Connie Rice, Connie Rice. Um, Condi, not Connie. There's a, there's a, there's a Constance Rice and Connelly's Rice, right? Connelly's Rice, play sweetly. At any rate, I won't say what Amiri Baraka called her in his poem, Somebody Blew Up America, which then led to them eliminating the position of uh, poet laureate. <laughs> so that Amiri Baraka <laughs> couldn't have that position anymore. Who was the governor? Uh, the one who, when they caught him up in some other things, said, I'm a gay American. The distract, what's his name? Um, McGreevy. McGreevy. Yeah, McGreevy. Yes. Is he still alive? Yeah. Somewhere. He's a priest now or something, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Say less. <laughs> Say so much less. <laughs> but the whole but I mean, the reason I'm bringing that up is because a lot of what we deal with is entertainment, is distraction, is subterfuge. But so I won't repeat what Baraka said about her, what she what he used to call her. But Connelly's a rice, who was uh what was Jay Johnson? Homeland Security. So he wasn't homeland security, he was a oh, she was a national security advisor. We're gonna talk about the NSA in terms of September the eleventh, um 1973. But we'll we'll get to that in a second. Um, the national security advisor, she is against sending a delegation from the United States to the World Conference Against Racism. Connelly's Rice said no. In fact, y'all can read my friend Clarence Luzane, my friend and colleague Clarence Luzane, who's in the political science department at Howard. He wrote a whole book called Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, where he traces a lot of this stuff. And there's been a lot written, but I, I, I recommend Clarence's book. Um, Condoleezza Rice is against sending a delegation. Colin Powell wants to go. This is initially. The Congressional Black Caucus 
fresh off their fight, if y'all remember, remember in the House of Representatives when they came to certify the vote and all them black people came to D.C. and said they're going to storm the Capitol and then the Capitol Police killed all the black people that uh, was that January 6th, 2000. Oh, no, that didn't happen. Oh, no, that was white people. Oh, no, they didn't get killed either. Yeah. OK. In fact, a lot of them go get scot free. No. What the black people did in the Congressional Black Caucus that day, they certified the vote is say, we say this vote shouldn't be certified because you stopped the count and all we need is one senator to help us. And not one senator came forth. Some of them people still in the Congress, right? Some of them still around. Some of them in the Biden amendment. Wait, was Joe Biden a senator? Anyway, all right. Anyway, as I was saying, but that same Congressional Black Caucus in, uh, in the summer of the year 2001 prevails upon the Bush administration and makes direct appeal to this first black secretary of state and national security advisor, send the delegation because this is the UN year, international year mobilization against all this stuff. Their response. And so <laughs> the United States ends up sending a lower level delegation sends a lower, lower level delegation. And at the World Conference Against Racism, I had a lot of friends who went. I wish I could have gone myself. They got back just before September 11th, right? Because the thing ended the 8th of September. Uh, Conrad Worrell was one of the people who went, wrote you know, a lot, of, a lot about this. But at any rate, all these people from around the world, the indigenous people of the world, you know, African people from all over. I mean, you know, obviously a lot of people from Asia, Southeast Asia, the world is gathered in South Africa for the World Conference Against Racism. Behind the scenes and then bursting into the actual meeting as the resolutions are being hammered out and debated and discussed, bursting into it trying to disrupt the European Union and the United States. Why? Because one of the one of the uh, declarations that was hammered out and y'all can look all this stuff up to all the reports are there because of the U.N. The United States can't control it. Uh, well, the United States does control it, but, you know, they don't think it matters because as long as they got the nuclear weapons and, and, and the money, the the, Europe, the 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 European world, which, by the way, is what we usually call the international community. I mean, with capital, when you, in fact, there was an article in many years ago, it was foreign affairs. And they said, when you say international community with capital I, capital C, that's Europe, the United States and the people they pull in to do their bidding. When you say international community with lowercase I, lowercase C, that's the world. So you hear them on news, the international community frowns. Okay. You talking about your thug gang. That's, that's a different group. But the international community consisting of the EU, United States, they were mad because one of the things that had been hammered out that made it into the final draft was a condemnation of Israel for how they treat the Palestinians and equating Zionism with apartheid. It was, oh, hell no, that got to go. Another thing that was in it that was hammered out, which spoke to the conversations between the Africans of the diaspora, including the United States, and the continental Africans, and by the ask, I mean the Caribbean, Latin America. Another thing that made it into the final draft, because guess what, Kadi, you can't say this. Guess what, Colin, you can't say this because you got an American delegation, but it's a lot of black people there who ain't part of your delegation. They part of the delegation of humanity. The other thing was a call for reparations. At that point, Colin Powell, who didn't go, pulled out the American delegation, the low-level American de delegation that he did send. That was September the 3rd. When they couldn't stop it, they couldn't bogart, they couldn't threaten nobody, they pulled it out. Again, I'm surprised at Jay Johnson. Bruh, you've been behind the curtain. You know what it is. You know it ain't no we. You know if you got a gun and some money, you can damn near get people to do what you want. And if you don't, if they don't do what you want, you just assassinate them. See Martin Luther King, see Malcolm X. Come on, bruh. Come on, bruh. Or hell, you threaten them with their livelihood. See Muhammad Ali. So anyway, look, brothers, come on. We're going to get to that in a second. But the whole point is, this had happened three days before September 11, 2001. And that was something people were talking about. So the attack happens on September the 1st. I'm sorry, September the 11th, right? And what happens after that? One person. Now, remember, I can understand why you might have been humming God Bless America, because remember, they all got up on the steps of the Capitol and was singing and had the flags. See, that is the that is a classic sign of fear. When you give everybody a little flag. That's why I got away flag lapels. 
Okay, you got you got to prove. If you got to wear it, then we all know it ain't real. Mm -mm. Or it's driven by insecurity. So they all out there, the Senate, the House of Representatives singing together. God bless all America. Singing the uh, national anthem. I'm sorry, the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, the Star Spangled Banner. I know they call it the national anthem, but in the governance structure, the national anthem in the United States is lift every voice and sing. But anyway, they're, they're singing them songs and they're all out there. To, and then they have to vote to basically rain fire on Afghanistan. Because remember, who's in that cabinet? Oh, Donald Rumsfeld. Donald dead now. You don't go to war with the army. You wish you had. You go to war with the army. You have Rumsfeld, who stretches back to the Nixon administration. Uh, Dick Cheney, who couldn't wait to get his hands on uh, Dick Cheney, like that white dude they booted out of Jeopardy, who pretended to have a search when he knew he was going to pick himself all along Cheney as the as the real president of the United States, while George Bush down there is reading the children's books and looking confused when they whispering in his ear. Dick Cheney is at the command bunker like we getting ready to run the whole table. I'm surprised at Jay Johnson for uh, acting like he doesn't know that these are opportunities that people who empower seize to put the agenda together they couldn't have done even the day before. By September the 12th, these cats got a plan. September the 14th, they can't go just straight. They got to get congressional approval, which has always been kind of murky. Uh, those of you who have heard of the War Powers Act, for example, you may look at that. Does the president just have the ability? No, you got to get congressional authority. Well, not for everything. Okay, no problem. September the 14th, they have a vote. And everybody, God bless America, waving the flags. Let's go bomb Afga Afghanistan. What's Afghanistan got to do with it? Well, Osama bin Laden had something. Wait, what? Wait, wait, is he over there? We don't know. No, we got to go. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Yes, everybody, yes. All opposed? Barbara Lee. Death threats. Let's kill her. That's because you've recovered from September the 11th where, hey, the thing is falling. Come on, let's go. Back. Okay. The generals, the army people start saying, we got to attack these Muslims. Why? Because our God is God and their God is Allah. You know, God, you know, Allah mean God in Arabic, right? <laughs> Don't matter. I have a different sound when I say them. I'm looking for somebody to hit. Barbara Lee says, I'm very uncomfortable with this. What if Barbara Lee had not been alone on September the 11th? I'm sorry, September the 14th. 2011. I'm sorry, 2001. I keep thinking 2011 because they did. They got Osama bin Laden 10 years later and 10 years ago. So halfway between where we are right now and the uh, and uh, and the September 11, 2001 was finally the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden, which they very quickly turned into several movies and made heroes of the Navy SEALs and we get to cheer again, even though that same type of level of military training is unleashed on the streets on black and brown and poor people anytime we get out just to have a protest, except, which means, of course, who are exempted from that, of course, are the protesters on uh, the uh, on January the 6th because they aren't protesters. They're white nationalist terrorists. Well, they, I guess they're really not terrorists. Are they terrorists if they're not punished, if they're not engaged? No, because some of them with them same people that was like, we killed him and we're going to kill everybody else. These tail head, rag heads, our God is God, their God is Allah. Meanwhile, people in the governance structure is like, yeah. Don't you think so? Well, I think, you know, you, you know how people in the governance structure speak. When they don't want to get in the argument. They'll say things like, yeah, you know, right is right and wrong is wrong. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, in other words, just in the abstract to get out of it while you thinking to yourself, boy, I hope I never see you in the street <laughs> because we know where y'all going with this. This isn't solidarity. This is white nationalism and white nationalism, terrorism, ter terrorism on the domestic front is not even classified as terrorism. We talked about critical race theory. Y'all who want to know a little bit something more about critical race theory, y'all go look at our conversation, but I'll mention this. One of the central objectives of critical race theory is to draw our attention and keep our attention on the fact that one of the powers of whiteness is making it ordinary. In other words, when somebody talking crazy, the fact that we don't immediately say you crazy, that means that it gets to be ordinary. And then it becomes the 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 kind of ordinary way we think about things. So they make a movie and they stick two or three black passengers on flight 93 and a black attendant. We say, yeah, see how we those people lost their lives in the middle 
of a terrorist attack that was caused in part by international wars that have been going on for centuries and then decades. And then in the case of Afghanistan and Osama bin Laden, who the United States government, again, surprised at Jay Johnson, subsidized in part because he was useful with the Mahajideen against the Russians, you know, stop watching movies for understanding. Because those things are just trying to reinforce through movement and memory this kind of artificial notion that there's a we so that the people who have their hands on the apparatus can execute whatever plan is in the interest of them and whoever they're with. It's a, it's not that complicated. In fact, we all know that. We just usually say less. So at any rate, Barbara Lee votes against the resolution. The resolution goes on. 20 years later, Guantanamo Bay. Okay, we know Osama bin Laden has something to do with it. Yeah. We suspect, we pretty much know that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had something to do with it. Yeah. Okay. You got Osama bin Laden, right? Yeah, he's dead. Okay. And you got Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Yeah. Yeah, but he, he we're going to get him a trial. Okay. Wh wait, that was 20 years ago. Where's the trial? For the first time this week, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four other defendants appeared in a courtroom. The first time in years they appeared in the courtroom and now they're saying the trial might be 2022 might be 2023 got a letter motion but the fact you know what they're arguing over now they're arguing because khalid sheikh muhammad and the other four they got detained um in the federal penitentiary in pennsylvania no where oh virginia no 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 nevada they got no oh that little piece of cuba that you stole in the 19th century that called Guantanamo Bay. That's not in the United States, is it? No. So federal law really doesn't apply there. No, we got this black ops site. Oh, Obama said he's going to shut that down. Bruh, I'm surprised at Jay Johnson. But anyway, anyway, the point is that the reason we know what we know and the reason that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and them are arguing against it is they're saying part of what you think you know about what we did, you got through torture. Remember that attorney general, John Ashcroft? <laughs> yeah, John Ashcroft in, in the bed. He was sick. Remember, he had that operation or something because groggy and stuff. And then his lieutenant came in. Oh, let's not even uh, you or John, you. Oh, anyway, let only get into it because when they finally uh, released documents, remember they had the torture prison in Iraq and all this stuff going on. In fact, they made movies about that. Remember uh, Denzel Washington and them in, in the siege? <laughs> Bruce Willis is the army and they loose the army in Brooklyn and they got the guy tied to the chair and the FBI, you know, Denzel is a good guy. He's a good guy everywhere, you know, except in training day, which is the reason they gave him the statue because even your good guys, they got a dirty up some point. So a hundred years from now, I said, well, you won an Academy Award. Yeah, for the one time you played a dirty guy. But at any rate, the point is that he's the FBI agent, Hop or Hap or whatever his name was and with Annette Benning and all them and then he comes in and Bruce Willis is torturing the Arab dude and he's like I can't go for this so you're gonna arrest the army yeah that's a real fantasy and some Negroes was sitting there thinking like them cats was on a different side but it, my point is that Guantanamo Bay you can do all that because it exists outside of American jurisprudence but I'm saying I'd say that as we're having this conversation Khalid Sheikh Mohammed still alive them four cats are still alive so if they did participate and plan, and they, and they likely did from what is known just to us, not even the people who got the other information, some of which was acquired by waterboarding. Remember all that? Again, never miss an opportunity to expand the security state, to expand your power. They are still alive, being held in Guantanamo Bay. And some of the people, many people been, who have been held over the years, never charged with anything. And in fact, they've been letting them go. In fact, one of the cats they let go is now, is now in Afghanistan with these people who, if you read the papers and watch TV, you think America's against. Well, actually, that's not true. If you read the papers, you know that the Biden administration has already been back channeling. And in some cases, in terms of Anthony Blinken, the secretary of state of the United States of America, having open conversations with the Taliban on how to at least stabilize relationships to go on. Why? Because when the United States and the Europeans leave, Russia, China, Pakistan going into that region, never left that region, are thinking this is how we are going to play the next iteration of what they call in this region in terms of geopolitics and all this warfare, the great game. All right, pause. Resume. Barbara Lee? No. Everybody else? Yes. 20 years later, trillions of dollars that could have gone into domestic programs or a whole lot of other stuff, gone. You left, 
And the cats who were in charge when you invaded are back in charge now. Am I am I am I getting that right? Let's not talk about that. Let's go back to September 11, 2001, because we want to remember why we did it. OK, if you remember September 11, 2001 and September 14, 2001, we were asking you then why are you invading there? Is that where he is? Uh, turn out the cat was in Pakistan, but you can't invade Pakistan. They got the bomb. Plus. India got to, oh yeah, you know, okay, fine. Two years later, you're going to Iraq. Why are we going in there? Because <laughs> Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld have been trying to get in that joint for years. <laughs> so what happens that was triggered September 11, 2001 is the next round of your, uh, of, well, yeah, actually of European, of US led invasions. Afghanistan 2001, Iraq 2003, but before it's over Syria, Pakistan. In fact, Let's bring our friend Barack Obama and his friend Hillary Clinton, who became Secretary of State, into this conversation. Does anybody remember 10 years ago, halfway between September 11, 2001 and today, just about, February 2011, they had something in North Africa called the Arab Spring. Young people all over North Africa and others fighting against authoritarian authoritarian regimes. I love going to Egypt. Myself, Dr. Beatty, Mario Beatty, Dr. Watkins, Lethe Watkins, we take students every August. Didn't go last year, COVID. Won't go this August, COVID. However, when we go, one of the reasons that we could go, and this is a painful thing, but I'm gonna bring it up. One reason that people can travel to the Nile Valley over the years is because Americans weren't worried about, and by Americans, I mean people with American passports, US passports wouldn't have to worry about, you know, being attacked or held hostage. Although sometimes that would happen. I mean, one time we were over there and there's some German tourists that got kidnapped at, at Hatshepsut's uh, mortuary temple. It was crazy. Um, and even then, people of African descent have a little bit different relationship. When we go to Kemet, we go to Egypt, uh, particularly we go south to Aswan, we're with the Nubians. You know, we have different conversations. I remember going to the Nile Valley after September the 11th, the first time I went. They were looking for me. I had left where we were staying, taking the ferry across the Nile over to downtown Aswan. And I'm sitting in the marketplace drinking hibiscus tea with these cats. And we talking about American foreign policy. And they were like, well, your president, George Bush. I was like, man, F George Bush. And then they all started laughing, poured me some more tea. And we started talking about, but we're the Nubians. I mean, I'm not a Nubian. I'm an African who came through enslaved ancestors, came through enslavement, born and raised in the United States and Tennessee. And these are Africans who were born and raised in the Nile Valley who are not Arab, although they are Muslim and speak Arabic. But we have a different even relationship than the other Americans because I'm watching tourists who are white Americans walking around and they looking at them and whatever they charged me, which was still probably a little high, but we don't care because we know we're going pay them a little bit more. They charged 10 times that to the white tourists and they paid it. <laughs> so I'm like, we black. This is, let's say it's the equivalent of $5. $5. I mean, I give you a nickel. Oh, come on, man. All right, fine, 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 fine. $4. Uh, I give you 35 cents. Man, oh, no. Then you walk away. All right, all right, fine. All right, fine, fine, fine. Uh, I'll give you two dollars. Nah, I'll give you a dollar. He's okay. What's your best price? Uh, your best price is dollar twenty-five. Here's a buck twenty-five. I probably could have got you down to a, a dollar, but I know that that twenty-five cent mean more to you than it does to me. And after you finish arguing about it, they say, sit down, have some tea. Meanwhile, here come the German tourists, here come the French tourists, here come the white American tourists. How much? Ten dollars. Here. Why? Because they, they don't understand. Arguing in the marketplace is, is a relationship. They ain't looking for no relationship with these non-white people. They looking to pay, get their trinket, bring it back here so they can talk about how wonderfully cosmopolitan they are. Meanwhile, <laughs> we are having a relationship. Negro, please. What is a Negro? Nothing. Uh, you you a Negro for trying to charge me $5 for this thing that you got at the factory for a nickel. I'm going to offer you a nickel. In other words, we're having a conversation. That is a way of knowing. That is a governance conversation. And we were doing that after September 11, 2001. And I know a lot of people in this room were doing that as well, except when the social structure shook a mic in your face. What do you think about September the 11, 2001? It was a tragedy. It was a lot of light, a lot of loss of life. I feel bad for all the people. Listen carefully to what people lead with. If they lead with, it was a tragic loss of life. 
then you know people are talking about our common humanity. We're all human. And that's what we saw come together that day. But if they lead with, it was an attack. And since then, we just have to show our strength in the world. Okay, this is some people who got another way of thinking about this. You, no one can argue with lo the loss of life. It's a tragedy. These cats hijacked planes and slammed them into the buildings. Nobody can defend that. And if you defend it, then you too are engaged in politics. You're not talking about our common humanity. And who can stand for that? Anyway, so what happened halfway between 2001, uh, September 11th, and, and now? One of the things that happened again was the killing of Osama bin Laden. And another of the things that happened was the Arab Spring. The reason we could go to Kemet, go to Egypt, and not worry about things if you're thinking about that passport as your protection is because the guy who has been running Egypt for decades, who is still alive, last I heard at Sharm el Sheikh, which is a resort on the Mediterranean Sea in north of Egypt, that guy, Hosni Mubarak, was a U.S. client. And one of the reasons those people got in the streets at Tahrir Square and other places to push that government out in Egypt because they had been repressing people, but he'd been doing it with U.S. support, U.S. money. And so if you were a U.S. passport holder, an American, you out in the Nile Valley, you felt like, okay, nobody gonna bother me. Because in part, America is in bed with the guy who people in Egypt, if you ask them about Mubarak, he's a good guy, he's a good guy. That's their response to the social structure they're in. But if you get them a little drunk and we sitting around in the middle of the night somewhere in the, in the village drinking, and they, yeah, man, they, what, what you think? Ah, oh, the guy's terrible, man. He, they hate the, right. Then the lights come on. Oh, Mubarak is cool. Why? Because they got real life army thugs out there, the Egyptian military, but they seize the moment. It happened in Tunisia, happened in Morocco, happened in, uh, in, in Egypt. And then Hillary Clinton has an idea. Bing! Barack, come here, bro. Let's get Gaddafi. Huh? Well, okay. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's, let's, let's get him. Let's get him. So they take out Muammar Gaddafi. They put a no-fly zone. In fact, there's a book called Slouching Towards Cert. Remember some of y'all watching TV like it was real? The, the, the revolt is now against the dictator Gaddafi. Is Gaddafi got clean hands? No, absolutely not. But if you are keeping in place a stabilizing agent in Egypt called Hosni Mubarak, and the guy in Libya says, Libyans, we are a people. So you're not going to be trading black people. Ain't going to be no slavery in Libya. And if people are trying to escape from poverty in the Sahara or the Sahel, remember the Sahara Desert, above the Sahara Desert is a thin, Sahara means desert in Arabic. So above the Sahara, the ocean of sand, you got a strip called the Maghreb. That's the fertile land on the Mediterranean. And then below the Sahara, you've got what they call the Sahel, the grass belt that stretches all the way from West Africa all the way across. And if you've got people who are leaving their conditions, driven out of their countries, economic conditions, military conditions, political conditions, trying to get to Europe, if they try to get to Libya, Gaddafi has Libya on lock. So every time some boats try to go to Italy, which by the way, all these people, Italy, all them, they're the ones who came down there and messing with these people in the first place. The relationship between, for example, uh, uh, um, Mm, you'll come to me in a minute. Um, Carthage. Y'all know Carthage, right? Hannibal. All this kind of thing. They've been messing around in North Africa for years since the Romans, before the Romans, really, the Greeks. But neither here nor there. Gaddafi is like, I will stop them here for a price. So he getting he getting billions of euros <laughs> from Italy to stop. And then Gaddafi saying, we're going to plow this money into Libya. There's water underneath the desert sand and we're going to create aquifers and aqueducts and we're going to turn the desert into a garden. And I'm going to build a highway and I'm going to fat. We're dri I'm driving to the organization of African unity, that the new African union meeting in Accra in Ghana, because I'm going to show y'all the African needs highways and we're going to ride our own highways. I ain't flying no plane. I mean, let's get him. Okay. No fly zone. 
Get the people that you are. Remember Ahmed Chalabi, the Iraqi dude who was living here in D.C.? Half them cats involved in the Libyan coup and the Libyan invade in the Libyan fight. We're living in the DMV, Northern Virginia, all this. I'm surprised at Jay Johnson. But at any rate, they come in. Gaddafi is killed in a brutal fashion. And don't take my word for it since 10 years ago. Take the word of the Financial Times. This was in Thursday's Financial Times. This is like the conservative global uh, version of the Wall Street Journal. See the headline? Gaddafi's death still haunts Libya's neighbors. Mm. So while this this is this is this is the people who don't agree with that. Look at look at this map. Look at all that. You see all them places that were affected? Because once you took him out, they got open slave markets in Libya now. Well, look, let's go get him. Yeah, why don't you go get him? Why y'all talking about women's rights in Afghanistan? Two words, two words. Boko Haram. Bring back our girls. Remember them? Well, they ain't important. Why? Because we now trying to figure out who's going to win the next year of uh, what's the next? Uh, what's what's Andy got on uh, Real Housewives this year? Andy Cohen. And you know, yeah. <laughs> no, what? No memory at all. Did the girls get back? I don't know. Did the, did the, I think about uh, Somiari Fubara, uh, who does a lot of work with them. Uh, my uh, her sister Aya and I went to grad school together and went to school together at Ohio State. But Somi, they're Nigerians, and she's been doing a lot of that work around the sisters who were retrieved and still fighting for the other girls who she, and they there've been ways of that. A lot of that stuff that happened in northern Nigeria, a lot of stuff that happened in Chad, a lot of stuff that has happened in Sudan, a lot of, a lot of that was unleashed once Gaddafi was taken out, which means all of that now is not under control and all them old racist ideas of anti-blackness are unleashed and weaponized also what by the Islamic version of white nationalists like the governor of Texas and Florida in the United States. In other words, not Islam at all. Or the Taliban, not Islam at all. But this idea, this patriarchal anti-woman attack, guess what? Triggered by the destabilization of Libya. And how could you destabilize Libya? Well, uh, you go back about 10 years and, uh, you know, I mean, I've got my lapel flag. Yeah, but it's on a tan suit. You see, you can't convince these people with a flag or doing whatever. And then you let this uh, these people get you into this and look back. And 10 years later, it don't matter because people going to argue about whether or not you had a mask on at your 60th birthday party. And then we all going to rush to defend you because we somehow mistake color for a similar p- politics and all this kind of thing. But September 11th every year reinforces the myth making that it was all for the good cause. You can't win an invasion. When you start talking about terrorists in Afghanistan, they the home team, they the home team. So if by that logic, other countries should invade the United States and go lock up them people that attacked the Capitol on January the 6th, right? No, it's not the same. It's the exact same thing. Are they not terrorists? Are they not terrorizing the people in this country? Yeah, and you've got a you got a governor in Texas that is stopping the right to vote. Could we get the Nigerian military to please invade Austin, Texas, and take out this governor because he's suppressing people's democracy? Yeah. Oh wait, and that and he also he's anti-woman. He's telling women that they don't have control over their bodies. Could we please get the Jamaicans and maybe get some uh, a delegation from Ghana and the South Africans to drop their military in and do something about this governor of Texas who is suppressing the vote and then telling women they don't have control over their bodies. It's not the same thing. Aren't you arguing over control over women's bodies in Afghanistan? Are, are we all going to play by the same rule? No, because you're the capital letter I see and the rest of us just the lowercase I see. September 11th, continue to propagate that. Now I'm going to bring this to a close because we got a transition. I'm looking at my clock and we've been going on and I really want us to to talk a little bit. In fact, let me just go ahead and do this now. One of the reasons, what was the uh what was the country you said they don't was it Peru? Peru. Yeah. So, again, remind us. You you were in conversation and this sister yeah. said what now? Well, one of my students, she said and where she's from in Peru, they didn't even talk about 9/11 um when it happened. There was no conversation about it at all. So she came here. Interesting. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. September the 11th, 
1973 will always be the September 11th, if remembered at all, and it is remembered by many in a Latin American country called Chile. And by extension, by countries where the United States has invaded and destabilize their governments because the United States government, again, Jay, Jay, come on, Jay, come on, Jay, bruh, you know, ain't no we, and you worked for the people who there, for who there is a we, military industrial complex, executive decision makers, wholly owned subsidiary of military industrial complex, uh, senators like uh, little Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham, who said we're going to go back into Afghanistan. You ain't going nowhere, little man. You you wouldn't throw rice at a wedding. And I know you was in the military. No, you was a judge advocate. That's the military lawyers. You ain't never shot nobody. If everybody said we're going to go back, would want? Yeah, well, okay. You want to go back? No problem. Here you go. Well, I'm, what am I going to do with this? You're going to have to go shoot because I'm not going back. Because every time you say we going back, it's my cousin, my mama. My daddy at the VA trying to get his benefits that you cut again. My sister who can't get a mortgage because her GI Bill don't cover it. In other words, when you say we, you mean me. <laughs> get the hell out of here. But when Jay Johnson says we, and he doesn't know we're going to have this solidarity, you never stopped having solidarity. And the solidarity came before September 11th, 2001. It came before September 11th, 1973. But in Chile and in Latin America and in the Caribbean and in a lot of places around the world who, who never keep their eye off the fact that the United States, the European Union, the institutions it controls in terms of the power decision making, not reports like the World Conference Against Racism, but who are we going to invade and send a force in like the UN Security Council? Who are we going to extend credit to, like the International uh, Money Fund or the uh, the uh, the American Development Bank? You control those. And that's a we. That's a hardcore we. It ain't even all the people in your country, which is why looking at Blood Brothers, I laughed because I'm like, look at how they edited this and how they talk. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to talk about this in about 10 minutes. I just want to bring this up because when Malcolm says, for example, you know, they love these Malcolm stories where. Malcolm and then Muhammad Ali and whoever, you know, like they found out that there were non-black Muslims and they were white Muslims and they came back to the United States and it changed their whole attitude. That's a lie. That's not even debatable. That is a lie. In fact, I'm going to put Malcolm on them in a minute because I'm like, y'all done made another documentary-ish where y'all where y'all lied on Malcolm X and you got his children in it, which, you know, when they, you know, we've all, we both set for these interviews, Professor Hunter. Where they interview you for, you for three hours, and then in the documentary, it's like they intersperse you in 10 second comments. As Malcolm once said, the media can make you say the opposite of what you said. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I know, see, I saw Peter Bailey in that documentary. Peter Bailey is my friend. Peter Bailey was one of Malcolm's lieutenants. In fact, if y'all get a chance, I've mentioned this book before, but if you get a chance, get this book Witnessing Brother Malcolm X, the master teacher. A memoir, Peter Bailey. That's Peter right there. He's in his 80s now. He worked for Ebony Magazine, Black World, Negro Digest. He lives down the street. I love that brother. When I saw Peter Bailey sitting there in the Audubon, a building, by the way, that Columbia University was going to wreck until black people got up and stopped them from doing it. In fact, if you want to know where the Audubon ballroom is, look at the opening scene in the video that Public Enemy shot for... Uh, um, Mm -mm -mm -mm. Here it is. Bam. And I say, God damn, this is the dope jam. Uh, Night of the Living Bass Heads. The S1Ws are marching up and down in front of the Audubon Ballroom. And the ballroom is abandoned. You can see the sign is still there, but the place, you know. And then later, in a parody of Public Enemy, Third Base, MC Search, they bumping into each other, marching up and down in front of the same ballroom. And <laughs> Which is why Professor Griff said that he got in a fight and tried to whip MC searches at you just going to disrespect the Audubon. But Columbia was going to knock it down. But now, of course, they didn't. And it's the Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz Center. Thank goodness. And you saw Ayasha there. You talked to Ayasha. And when we get to that, I will ask you that, how that conversation went. But I saw Peter Bailey. So I know Peter said all this. I know it as sure as my name. Well, I don't know. As Malcolm would say what my name was. As soon as sure as the birth name I was given coming here is Greg Carr. I know Peter Bailey told them that as many times. Peter Bailey, if he talks more than five minutes, he talks about this international piece. But let me let me let me get to the point because they lied on Malcolm and we're going to tie that to what we're talking about right now. So 
I said 10 minutes, so I'm going to take two off and now say eight. Salvador Allende was taken out in a coup d'etat that was fomented, supported by the Central Intelligence Agency of the, Agency of the United States of America under the administration of Richard Milhouse Nixon and his national security advisor. What was his name? He's still alive. He still be going to parties. and she, He's the one who famously said, Power is, uh, power is the greatest aphrodisiac. What's his name? Uh, he's a real war criminal, but he's living it up these days. He's probably been to the White House this in this administration. Um, oh, yeah. Henry Kissinger. Anyway, we'll come to that. We're coming to it in about seven minutes. Salvatore, Salvador Allende Gossens, born in 1908, a medical doctor a member of the uh, Chamber of Deputies, which is the House of Representatives in, in Chile, um, who was a minister of health in a previous presidential administration in the 1940s, became a senator in the United uh, in the uh, Chilean upper house, 1945, ran for president several times and won in September, 1970. An open socialist, a, a scholar, a thinker, you know, a lot of Marxist ideas. But remember by 1970, you've had Fidel Castro for 11 years in Cuba. By 1970, you've got the Caribbean uh, on the verge of perhaps having some of these types of uh, uh, societies begin to emerge. A little bit later in the decade, you're going to see Michael Manley in Jamaica, for example. And then, of course, by the end of the decade, into the early age, you have people like Maurice Bishop in Grenada. Um, you know, they make a movie like Heartbreak, Heartbreak Ridge and you start cheering for Clint Eastwood till you realize the United States helped take him out. And then in Latin America, you've got these what they call leftist uh, governments. But one of the common elements they have is they trying to root out this banana republic politics where the United States is dominating their uh, their politics because of the economic interests of the United States and its actors. We had that whole conversation. We talked about Costa Rica and Garvey and the United Fruit Company. These are the governments coming out of the colonial period that are trying to seize authority for the people of their countries against the international community, the IC. And of course, the oldest of those countries to do that is the one we've talked about a lot over the over the episodes, which is, of course, the Haitians. But so what do you have? Salvador Allende becomes president. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon calls in his director of the CIA, Richard Helms, and says we must prevent Salvador Allende from becoming the president of Chile. Now, this is the same rumor. Y'all can go look all this stuff up. Because Allende won the election with about 36 and a third percent of the vote, I meaning he didn't have a majority, which means that the Chilean legislature had to uh, ratify him. And so Nixon, through the CIA, oh, Nixon and Kissinger, through the CIA, bribed, cajoled, tried to white mail, I won't say blackmail, the, 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 the legislature. But Allende was smart. He gave them some concessions in terms of laws. He would they he said, no, we'll, we'll change the Constitution. If y'all vote for this, I'll support it. Some libertarian stuff, pretty much. And through a consensus, he is ratified as the president of Chile. He takes office in November 1970 and from November. 1970 until. Two planes, two jets don't crash into the World Trade Center September the 11th, 2001, but two planes, two jets bomb the presidential palace on September 11th, 1973. Salvador Allende is the president. He begins to put deep reforms into the Chilean uh, society. We got to put a floor under the poor. We got to expand the economy. And he starts doing some things they don't like. One of the first things he says is, you know what? We got to do something about these copper mines. Copper is one of our greatest exports. We're going to nationalize the mines. Oh, the United States hates that. So what do they do? They pick up the phone and make some calls to the capital letter I, capital letter C, international community. The World Bank shuts off all loans to Chile. The Export Import Bank shuts off all loans to Chile. The Internet, the, the uh, American Development Bank shuts off all access to capital to Chile. Slowly over those years from 70, 73, you start seeing strikes in the economic sector. People are hurting now. The CIA is identifying people in the military who they can use to, to say, well, we just need to take this guy out. This guy is running us in the ground. 
all the external pressure is cracking the Chilean economy. Inflation begins to ramp, uh, ramp up. Food shortages begin to ramp up. And the middle class, not the poor people, the poor, poor people sticking with him, but the middle class, now they going in the press, all the white press, all in the international community. Oh, this guy's a dictator. He's a thug. We got to do something. To Sound familiar, y'all? This is the CIA playbook, which is going to be important in about two minutes. There is a lit. There was a literal and is a literal CIA playbook. Just like there's an FBI playbook, because remember, from 70 to 73, this is also the time when you got them putting political prisoners in jail in the United States in, in the wake of the Panthers, the weather underground, a lot of people still in jail. We talked about that during Black August. And it's also the period when these white kids break into an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, which is really the area around Philadelphia, West, Western Philadelphia. West Philly in media PA and they uncover these documents and leak them to everybody that's called uh, uh, that shows us the counterintelligence program. So all that's coming out at the same time. It's also the time during this period that the United States military is now being, no, I'm sorry, the United States intelligence apparatus is being questioned by the United States government, not by the executive. They love doing this stuff. No, by the um, by the legislative branch, Senator Frank Church, for example, if y'all haven't heard that name, look up Frank Church, because Frank Church is the one who had the church committee that that really pushed it on, pushed on COINTELPRO, because when you invade another country, they want to say, oh, we are rallying the troops. We're coming together. But this is a different period by the 1970s. How do we know? I'll drop this footnote in going back to September 11, 2001 to now before I finish up with the end day. During the so-called Korean War, War, Harry Truman raised taxes on the top tax rate in this country to help pay for the war. During the invasion of Vietnam, Lyndon Johnson raised taxes on the top uh, income earners or income getters. <laughs> Say earners because earn is a funny word. Did you earn it when somebody else's labor went into the value of your stock? But at any rate, I guess maybe technically, I don't know, I'm get into that. During the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War, George Bush pushed through a tax cut for, for that same group. So when you see Senator Church pushing back against COINTELPRO, because they've, they've weaponized the surveillance apparatus using the Vietnam War as an excuse and using the black freedom struggle as an excuse, wiretapping Dr. King, wiretapping Malcolm X, following people around. Uh, the reason we got some of the things that they played in that Blood Brothers documentary is because the federal government is listening to everybody and now they're going to release the tapes when they think it can't hurt anybody. So the expansion of security state, I guess I'm surprised at Jay Johnson, but so from 70 to 73, they're attacking Allende. They're undermining Allende. The CIA is literally, Nixon authorized $10 million to the CIA to go pay people in Chile to destabilize this government. And on September the 10th, 1973, Nixon gets word. The coup that we're planning this time is in place. We got a guy, the head of the military. You know his name. The head of the military became the dictator who ruled over Chile for 17 years. In fact, they did a law and order, uh, a, a law and order episode because in taking over, he ended up killing two Americans. And y'all know American life is more precious than any other life, which is why the first thing, were there any Americans? When you even asked that question, you didn't showed that there wasn't no 9-11 solidarity. You looking for American life? Is that different than life? Well, I don't know. The guy who they finally got to go with them who took out Salvador Allende, General Augusto Pinochet. Y'all remember Pinochet? Pinochet just died in like 2016 or something like that, 2006 maybe. He, um, a straight thug. And so they bomb the presidential palace. Two jets, boom, boom. And then within the next 30 minutes, six more runs. Boom, 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 boom. They killing people in the presidential palace. Somehow, Allende survives. When they find Allende, he is dead, however, from a single gunshot wound to the head. The general consensus is it's self-inflicted. Fidel Castro uh, said that, no, he died shooting back at the military. That's probably not true. But again, myth-making, just like the passengers took down the plane in Shrankersville. You, some things you just got to let go. I mean, that's what you know. But the autopsy, they finally exhumed his body, I think, in 1990. 
uh, no, Pinochet was president for 17 years, then spent another 10 years in charge of the military, then became a senator for life. And then Spain decided they wanted to prosecute him for crimes against humanity. And so they asked the United States, will you help us? United States was like, no, but so much pressure from the people around the world. When you say September 11th to them, they think September the 11th, 1973, the United States led a four minute coup against Salvador Allende, which was a proxy for the coups against everybody else whose government you don't like in the hemisphere. Y'all look at this playbook. Here's where we come. They, the Spanish and these other y'all declassify the documents. You know, say like we ain't classify no damn documents. Who was president at the time? Must have been was it Nixon? No, was it George H. W. Bush? No, it was a uh, oh, it was y'all friend Bill Clinton? Bill's like, no, we we can't we can't we can't declassify these documents. So he asks his Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. Albright, can we? Uh, Madeleine Albright is like, yeah, I don't know if we should do that. But the pressure keeps mounting. September 11th, September 11th. What did y'all do? What did y'all do? The guy Pinochet, he because now he's traveling abroad, just an open thug in the capital letter I, capital letter C community. And they don't want to just be seen straight with blood on their hands. And like Spain ain't got no blood on their hands. They ask everybody they tried the house. And the only reason we ain't speaking Spanish is because the English cut them off with Virginia, 1619 project. Hmm. No, let's go back. 75 years when the Spanish got there first. And the only reason we ain't speaking Spanish is because England went out on the North American continent. But that having been said, what you see is Spain is able to prevail and the United States under the Clinton administration does release some documents. But what Albright, what the U.S. Uh, administration wanted to avoid is what something they call the Pinochet precedent. Because, see, the reason they had to do it was not only international pressure on the outside, on the inside in the capital letter I, capital letter C international community, they have agreements with these other European countries that they expect to be honored both ways. And one of them is if we got a thug over here, we trying to prosecute, you got some documents on him. If it's not going to interfere with your national security, we need those documents, release them. So Clinton and them agreed to release the documents, not only to Spain, but make them public. But it takes them years. Why? Because the CIA comes in and says, um, who was the director of the CIA at the time? Oh, yeah. September 11, 2001, uh, two years later, the invasion of Iraq. It was a guy who stayed, uh, George Slam Dunk Tenet. George Slam Dunk, remember the invasion of Iraq is a slam dunk. He has weapons. They still look for them damn weapons. And Colin Powell shaking a vial of, uh, a vial of chalk. I might as well have been shaking my damn timer. But at any rate, Tenet and the CIA, we ain't releasing these documents along with the National uh, Security Administration. They said, we ain't releasing these documents, why? Because if we release these documents, you will find out techniques we use that we still use today. That was the official explanation. And if you all been listening for the last 10 minutes, as I uh, stopped there, you know, when you hear in the reports that dictators in Bolivia, Evo Morales, dictators in Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, there, there's a handful of intrepid legislators, Juan Guaido, that fool, who are trying to take the government back for the people. And then you look at the protests and it's a bunch of rich people banging on pans in Caracas <laughs> who tell evil. And then when they do take over, the first thing they do is act like the governor of Texas or Florida and start using uh, theocracy, trying to create theocracies. And then they fly to D.C. and take pictures with American legislatures and presidents. The CIA said, if we release these documents, they're going to find out our playbook. So those documents were never released. Now, what does that got to do with Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X? A lot. Because myth-making isn't just about September 11, 2001. As Professor Hunter, we uh, we watched this Blood Brothers as we wanted to a close here, at least this our last topic. Before we enter this and make this connection, I want to ask you, I mean, this new Netflix series, and I, and in back of my mind, I was asking myself, why are they so obsessed now with Muhammad Ali? I mean, the man made transition in 16. It's taken them this long to get the stuff because Ken Burns got a multi-part documentary coming out on PBS on Ali. And I love Ken Burns again. I have no problem with Ken Burns. I embrace Ken Burns as a as a fine representative of the social structure. Ken Burns could never make one second of one minute of one hour of a documentary for me because he is determined to do what everybody in the American social structure wants to do. 
which is break our story up enough apart to make some nice earrings and bracelets and maybe a nice hat and maybe a nice little outfit to wear on the 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 body of white nationalism. And Ken Burns is an expert at it with his, you know, music. But now he's at Ali. And then we saw Blood Brothers. What what is that about? Because you had a conversation with the brother who directed it. Can you? Women. You, I'm going to get home because I want to make sure I don't interrupt. No, uh, no. Also, my outburst when I'm laughing. Uh, y'all don't need to hear that. Uh, <laughs> no, so, no, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so I interviewed Marcus Clark with an E, uh, whose parents come from Jamaica. Uh, uh-huh. He was named for Marcus Garvey. His parents were you know, part of that whole movement. And I was really excited. I hadn't seen it yet. Uh, Ilyasa, the youngest daughter, you all know that famous picture. It's also featured prominently in the documentary. She's sitting on Muhammad Ali's lap and that image of Malcolm and, uh, excuse me, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali with the daughters and Betty Shabazz, the little girl, the littlest of, of the Shabazz um, daughters is sitting on Muhammad Ali's lap. She does not remember that day. She was too little. She does not remember their relationship. Mm-hmm. So she opens the documentary. But I was really excited because, you know, the, We saw one night in Miami. We talked about that here in class as well. And, you know, the relationship and then the back and forth and then the fissure, the the, the separation, um, the rise of Muhammad Ali into our, into the framework of who we are Mm -hmm. was directly responsible. You know, uh, Malcolm X was directly responsible for that in many ways, you know, Um, and, and the documentary will tell you that, you know, Muhammad Ali knew uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad before he knew Malcolm X, but it was Malcolm X's tutelage. So let's be very clear. No way. That led that 21 year old, 21 year old to an enlightenment and to an understanding of himself beyond just being pretty and, and <laughs> yeah, no. So That's I, was right. excited. That's I was excited. So there were a couple of things I just want to, you know, without getting too much, I'll watch it, but I'm watching it with a different eye and a different lens. Thanks to you. I'm watching it for the cinematography. I'm watching it for, you know, how the, the archives and what footage they use and, and the images that they use. And that. so, yeah, there were a couple of moments that I was really disappointed mm. in the people that they, um, talk to. Uh, and it was two in particular, I'm not going to give their names, but they both had a similar cadence and a similar lightness of voice and very, very, um, <laughs> soft, not just soft spoken, but high, like a, on a higher register. And, and they both seemed to lack the depth to be able to have a conversation about either one of these gentlemen. And they kept disrespectfully referring to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as Elijah of course. He just bothers me. And Malcolm as Malcolm. You weren't friends with them. I tell my students this all the time. You're never going to refer to me as Karen. We're not friends, colleagues, or contemporaries. You will Come always on. give me my respect. But more importantly, anybody that comes in, I tell my young producers, when you refer to somebody that's you're inviting, you call them Dr. Mr. And Mrs. Because y'all ain't pals. They're not pals. You're friends. You don't know them that familiar. Um, you know, y'all not that familiar. And I hate it. every time they kept saying Elijah. And I was like, ugh. You no, they don't respect. I mean, a social structure. We give we give credit to those who prop up the, one, the other one was melanemic. Um, and both of them acted like they were authorities. And I'm like, yo, why why are they getting so much FaceTime? I realize now that they might have had something to do with the, the book or something. I don't no, know. It was documentary ish. Oh, it was the ish, right? It is ish. It is documentary. In fact, here go the book, right? We talked about the book. Blood, Blood Brothers. We, you, you don't mind if I name the names, do you? you go ahead. Knock, yeah. yeah, this is uh that whole documentary was based on this book, Blood Brothers, by Randy Roberts and Johnny Smith. Johnny Smith was the younger of the two white dudes. Randy Roberts, you know, Randy Roberts, who said Muhammad Ali, when he was in Rome in 1960, when he was boxing, he was like the mayor of the Olympic Village. Here's a little tip. When white people call you the mayor or something. That means you ain't got no power. You're just like the the, the 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 court jester. He was like the mayor of the Olympic Village. Okay. Just like you the mayor of documentarians, huh? Or some or the mayor of this subject. <laughs> you know but come on back, Professor Hunter, because I, I, I'm interested in hearing because Marcus Garvey's uh son, living son, Julius, was in it as well. Yeah, and now that I didn't realize the brother was Jamaican, his people are Jamaican. That might explain why Julius, because they had some very phenomenal interviewees interspersed in it, like Peter Bailey and Julius Garvey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing was, you know, this whole 
and and the more we have these clean glasses of water poured for us on Saturdays and beyond, um, the more I'm realizing that you know the purpose of these these uh, public facing, and I don't even want to call them documentaries. The the plethora the 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 the, the amount of documentaries that are being flooded into the marketplace um, to tell our stories. Right. Wrong to tell our stories um, <laughs> in a wrong way. You right. know, just well, for their purposes. But what are their purposes? Well, I think their purposes are to again, their purposes aren't our liberation, aren't our elevation. I don't mean the black elite or the black middle class. And I don't mean a black director, a few black producers. I don't even mean the children of the figures that are being discussed. I mean the vast majority of us who don't have health care, who don't have uh the security of to be free from being assaulted by the state, whether it be through police or through bureaucracy. I mean, the people who are the people that Ali and Malcolm were talking about. And so, you know, their objective is I think there's there's several things in the social. Let's just look at it right quick. Social structure. Their objective is to break up black formations and then absorb them into this imaginary white narrative. Again, critical race theory. Part of critical race theory's objective is to help us focus on how whiteness operates in this society. Whiteness is most powerful when it creates itself as the norm. So, you know, Randy Roberts, and I was actually on some, maybe National Public Radio when the book first came out. This book was published in, hold on, let me flip it. This book was published 2016. So maybe the following year, I was on a radio program with Randy Roberts. Again, I, I don't have anything against any of these people. I, I, they should write all these books. They should do whatever they do. Our problem is when we use these books as our authorities instead of looking in the mirror and asking our people. But I remember in the conversation we were having, I was like, it's very interesting how Malcolm and uh, and Ali, you know, brother Malcolm and, we, you know, black folk will say brother Malcolm because in the governance structure, we still think of him that way. And, uh, and, and black people who are not Muslims. We're not Muslims. In fact, let me just do this. Where's Peter's book? Let me just do this. From, from This from Peter Bailey who knew them both. Peter Bailey says this on the first page. He said, most of us were not members of the Nation of Islam. He was not. This, boy, this man from Tuskegee, Alabama, brought up the Christian church. Most of us were not members of the Nation of Islam, nor Muslims religiously, nor from the streets, nor ex-felons. In fact, most of Brother Malcolm's Muslim supporters were, not, were also not as often projected ex-felons. Most of them were serious opponents of the white supremacist racist system that's so entrenched in this country. Most of us did not regard Brother Malcolm as some kind of God figure who was going to miraculously save us. Rather, we looked upon him as a great human being, a great black man, a rise charismatic leader, a man with a plan. We were impressed with his integrity, his vast knowledge of the true state of race relations in the United States, his commitment to and love for black people, his ability to communicate with everyone with whom he spoke from heads of state to young people in the inner city neighborhoods who were caught up in the white supremacist racist system. Now, next sentence, because I know he said this. He says it all the time and y'all about to hear it. And it wasn't in that documentary. His connecting us to the struggle being waged in Africa and other places against European colonialism and his courageous willingness to put his life on the line in the campaign for equal rights, equal justice and equal opportunity. That is not the objective. Netflix objective is profit. Anybody working with Netflix objective is profit and notoriety and platform. And while they're doing it, they want to do well and do good at the same time. A lot of them, I don't question their motives. What they don't understand is individuals don't beat institutions. Netflix is part of a larger institution. It's part of the economic wing of the international capital letter I community capital letter C. These producers and directors and y'all part of the lowercase I C. The lowercase I C don't beat the uppercase I see without organization. And what Malcolm was doing, what brother Malcolm was doing is was about organization. What Muhammad Ali ended up doing was about organization. That's not in the documentary except to freeze them in black and white in the 60s, freeze Malcolm at his death, freeze Muhammad Ali in the nation, and then Wait until, and it ain't no such thing as a spoiler alert. If you study this stuff, you know. Y'all know the stories. Freeze him until the last five minutes where you drop into talking heads. Todd Boyd out of University of California. Uh, I, I was conflicted when I bought the Malcolm X 
uh, postage stamps and they lied on Ali and they showed him at the Olympics after he got sick. That's when they can embrace him. Oh, that's true. That should have been at the beginning of the documentary. You stuck that in. So you got a fig leaf to cover yourself from the critics. Guess what? I done burned that damn fig leaf off. <laughs> documentary ish. It ain't enough. It's and then good. and then and then H Hannah and I was thinking, when are they going to mention this? Because remember they asked Rachman. Yes. They asked Rachman what your brother thought, and he said, I don't know. Rachman and Muhammad. Let me not get into this because one of my students, I love this young brother. I was telling you, uh, Sean Ali Mickens, who uh, that's his great uh, great uncle. You know, so Rachman and he know him and Rachman, you know, they hang out together. A young cat. In fact, he was in the streets in Louisville when they Brianna Taylor. He's from Louisville. And when you when you see him, he just makes you smile. When he first introduced himself, we were talking. He came to my class, even though he wasn't in the class. He said, I was told I need to come in here and listen to what you're saying. Oh, what you why you say it like that? Then we started talking. He was he was he came there to judge me the way he's supposed to be. <laughs> now, now, should I take a class with you? Why? Because I can't. And we got to talking later on in the conversation that came out. He said, yeah, Muhammad Ali, you know, my great uncle. I started laughing. He said, why are you laughing? I said, of course he is. He looked like Muhammad Ali. He looked like, uh, and he's got the same generosity of spirit. And when he came in the room, it was like five or six other freshmen with him who was just like around him. I said, this is, now I have a glimpse of that ethos that's in your bloodline. Well, some, some of that is physical, but, but to my point, Rachman, Whatever he's going through in his life as he approaches transition into ancestorhood, I suspect it's what some of what his brother, it wasn't just getting hit in the head. Because when you hear Rachman, so when you ask him a question, I'm not sure that he can he can access all of his memory bank. In fact, I'm pretty sure he can't, but you could hear. But when Hannah came on, I said, finally, two seconds before it was over, she said, what if you read her book with her father, Soul of a Butterfly, Ali said. You don't have to ask Rahman what Muhammad Ali said about Malcolm because Rahman, because Ali writes through his daughter who interviewed him in Soul of a Butterfly. One of my greatest regrets was that I didn't make up with Malcolm X. I should never have let them split us up. Mm. And in fact, if I had to do over now, again, I wouldn't do it. He said that. You understand? They don't even say that until right at the end. So if you don't watch to the credits, and then they just slipped it in, which lets me know. I'm sorry to use the language of the uh, Nation of Islam. That documentary is tricknology. Oh. <laughs> anyway, let me know. <laughs> you think about how? Um, again, for me, I'm watching with an eye on what we can learn, what we can glean, things different. Yes. Pull from it. And it was a couple of things. That moment reminded me that Muhammad Ali was 21 years old. Come on now. First of all. Yeah. We know about the brain and it's being fully formed at a certain time. You know, highly influ influenced, but also it was around a naming, right? So Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave him a name that would take uh, most Muslims three years to get a name. Right. In fact, I don't even think Malcolm X had his full name at this point. Well, well this is this is the point. The first name you get in the nation is your ex. He right. had Cassius X. Right. No so question. That's he right. He went straight to Muhammad Ali. Right. And that was the thing that allowed for. And and in that moment, Malcolm X knew I, he's gone from from me. You know, like I have lost whatever. But that's what they said. But I'm like, I don't even think Malcolm X would have thought about it in terms of winning and losing. You know, well, 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 you, you heard the interviews. Did, did he even say that every time one of them white reporters put the mic in his mouth? What did Malcolm say? I'm not going to let y'all. Right. And then what did Ali say? Even at that age, Ali said, first of all, I don't believe. Remember when he was first born in Chicago? My brother. Yeah, that's my, my brother. brother. <laughs> even at the moment, he, they broke apart. He never said he wasn't his brother until after he got killed. And he, see, this way I got to read Ishmael Reed's book. Ishmael Reed wrote a book called A Complete Muhammad Ali. And you know, Ishmael Reed don't give a F about it. He didn't interview. Understand, but no, Professor Hunter, let me ask you this, because again, this is another one of your countless areas of expertise. I just asked you this broad question, <laughs> having covered so many of these people. Professor Hunter, is the fight game dirty? <laughs> what is that a question? <laughs> I'm just asking. You know, is there any organized crime around the fight game? I mean, are you asking that question as could a question? Could you help us? Because there's some no, people from other countries who okay. might just. <laughs> the answer is yes. Of course, it's so so, uh, so. so, so when you have a Sunny Liston 
And mm -hmm. as you know, Reed writes about this. When you have a Muhammad Ali, this Louisville group, I'm assuming these are all businessmen with no connection <laughs> to muscle or the mob. I'm just asking. No, yeah, right. And and the fact that, that we got a glimpse of that too, once, once there were uh, rumors that he was uh, possibly becoming a black Muslim, right? Which, they call it, um, which Malcolm X constantly said, "Black Muslim, no, he's he's follower of Islam." Like, right. stop with that. Um, they met with him and was like, "Okay, there's nothing we can do to stop you, but please don't say it out loud." Right. Well, why couldn't they stop him? Because he. Well, tell me why. Why? No, he no, 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 no. Please don't leak. Let me say. And remember now. Remember his name, Herbert Muhammad, who became Ali's. Manager, you got to read Ishmael Reed, who interviewed all these guys, who none of them were in the even the ones who are still alive. So, Professor Hunter, is the Nation of Islam associated with people who might not necessarily have come from backgrounds where they hadn't used their fists or maybe guns or knives? Or hmm. I don't. Is there anybody in the Fruit of Islam who might not be scared of the mob? Or yeah, yeah um, I'm hmm. sure. yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But let's just hypothesize. Yeah. You got your you got your teeth in this in this ATM called Muhammad Ali. And here come these Muslims who ain't scared of you and who in fact will invite you into the street. Some of the Muslims that like uh the ones that uh that uh Bumpy Johnson being portrayed by our brother Forrest Whitaker is kind of giving you a glimpse of in in uh in Harlem. Godfather of Harlem. Yeah. Godfather of Harlem. I, I'm, in fact, let's just go to Godfather of Harlem. Vincent the Chin Gigante ain't got no smoke <laughs> that Bobby Johnson is scared of. And here come Malcolm with a bunch of cats. A few of them was in the street like that. And they're like, uh, I got the guns. I got the soldiers. Muhammad Ali, this isn't just about, oh, I accept that there's no God but Allah. This is also about, you, you ready? This is our man now. <laughs> oh well we, well, we can't stop him. See, you know what I'm saying? Because you know, white, if they can stop you, they're gonna stop you. Right. The reason they can't stop those cats in part, Ishmael Reed goes through this in great detail. One of the reasons they can't stop them is because they want that smoke. Y'all ready? We ready. In fact, Muhammad Ali, it's so funny you say that. Remember when he, when he comes, when he sees um, what's my man in Chicago? Uh, they're in Miami. His daddy was uh oh, what's the boy's name? Um, Rachman. His name's name is Rachman, too. Yeah, Rachman Ali. No, no, not Rockman. Rockman is, is his brother. But at any rate, remember when he said my dad was there in Miami and Ali is across the street and he said, he heard him say, why are we called Negroes? <laughs> why are we? He was like, oh, you know the teachings. Ali had been in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And remember they put it on the album, on the the the, the, uh, the, uh, the single. Now, y'all y'all know that single. Oh, my friend, it's easy to tell. White man heaven is a black man hell. When the black man was brought to America, we before the black man was brought to America, we were living in the East by the Nile River. We wore uh, silks and slippers of gold. We had untold riches, I'm told. And then he says, you know, now we are the poorest of the poor. Nobody wants us at their door. Oh, my friend, it's easy to tell. White man heaven, black man hell. And then what, what Farrakhan does that, Gene Walcott, the charmer as he was known, Calypso Gene out of Boston, he starts walking through the history. He said, this is what a white man, he said, red man, I'll treat you the best. Then he pushed the Indian further west with his white woman and fire water. Tricks and lies, he stole America. Now the original owners of this nation are pent up on the reservation. Oh, my friend, it's easy to tell. White man heaven, black man hell. To a calypso beat. Then you hear bling, 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 bling. fair kind playing the violin. I mean it's it's but he starts that mm. um that 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 recording, he's playing the ukulele. So you hear him bling, 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 bling. then he says, Why are we called Negroes? <laughs> so so Ali is standing across the street and the, he sees the nation of Islam cat. Why are we called Negroes? And the brother said, Oh, you've been listening to the teachings because Farrakhan took the teaching, supreme wisdom, which is why you see the brother from the nation in his full regalia there with the lessons. But he had been in Chicago. So when he says, well, it wasn't Malcolm. No, nah, you have been around these cats. But 
These ain't no punks. Whatever you are, and look, we have our internal debates, discussion in the government session about the nation of Islam, what it is or isn't. But if you talking about the MGT and the FOI, if you talking about the fruit, you talking about those sisters, they ain't no punks. And so part of Ali becoming Muslim means he also gains that apparatus. And part of Ali being split from Malcolm, that's the internal politics. That is the internal politics to be sure. But in terms of, let's just go through it very quickly and then we'll wind this up. The social structure, breaking up those breaking up those stories so they can fit into an American story because their ultimate objective in the terms of the white nationalist part of this social structure is forgiveness. <laughs> they want forgiveness. Critical race theory, again, how, in other words, it ain't us, it was y'all. And remember, they both figured out we ain't so bad. In fact, they both figured out we're all brothers. Oh, come on, Robertson Smith. Is that what these blood brothers figured out? That y'all. So in other words, we ain't going to talk about 1967 when y'all took Ali's boxing license for three years and put to, and threatened him with five years of jail and $10,000 fine. We ain't going to talk about how uh, Ali, uh, when he got his license back and beat the damn thing at the Supreme Court, took his thing international. So we ain't going to talk about the thrill in Manila. We ain't going to talk about the so-called rumble in the jungle. Get Louis Ermer. In other words, you see what that said? Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. What? On a global state. See, this is what the social structure in America don't want you to deal with. Muhammad Ali is beloved around the world precisely because he was not part of the American uh, social structure. And, and in other words, when Muhammad Ali would travel, I experienced that myself. That story I told y'all about being in Aswan, every time we go to Kemet with the Nubians, that's just an echo of how Ali was received around the world. When we see Adla at the funeral, at his funeral in Louisville, that carefully curated funeral, you got to go with the family, go with the wife. And so she's up there talking about her father and you see everybody sitting there nodding their head or whatever. What Who you didn't see a glimpse of was Minister Farrakhan, who was there. Or the day before when they had the Muslim ceremony, Farrakhan spoke. Why? You can't keep Farrakhan out. Why? Because that's a complicated history between Farrakhan and nation. And because Malcolm brought Farrakhan into the nation. Farrakhan, like Ali, stayed with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And as you said, all the black people calling him the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to Peter Bailey's point, they're not Muslims, but we respect. Them white boys, hey man, I mean, I wrote a book. Hey, I, I did something too. And the one non-white dude, uh, Zaire Ali, who works, you know, worked with Manny Marable on which it, what on what is the worst, in my reading estimation, of the of the Ali biographies, which means it's the one that won all the awards from the social structure. He also not referring to Elijah Muhammad as the honorable Elijah Muhammad. That honorable Elijah Muhammad does not mean that you are a member of the nation of Islam. It don't even mean that you think that Elijah Muhammad's version of Islam was Islam. It means that in the social structure, that's what y'all call him because that's what I'm going to call him. In other words, so now I said all that, as John Henry Clark say, there are some stories, there aren't no good guys. Let's go to the second category, six, governance, mass grievances, mass organizing. This is Ali. This is uh, Malcolm. What you don't see in that documentary you don't see anything past Malcolm's assassination, really. You jump to the Olympic torch and he got sick. What did Ali say about being black in America after he became a real Muslim and forgave us in the social structure? That's a lie. Remember George Bush gave Muhammad Ali the Medal of Freedom, 2005, and Presidential Medal of Freedom. If y'all want to see a documentary on Muhammad Ali, the best one that's been made so far until we make some better ones is one called The Trials of Muhammad Ali. It goes through that court case. I think that was 2013. I saw it at the museum, which ain't there no more. The director came and I went down there because I wanted to sit up close and I'm, I want to see the screen. I want to hear what these cats talking about. That documentary opens with Minister Farrakhan. Farrakhan says he talked to Ali. This is after 2005. He said, I was with Ali and we were talking and I said, brother, you have won all the awards. How does it feel to have been embraced by the country that you have critiqued and and, and at one time rejected you? Because remember, after he doesn't take the step in that fall of, 20, uh, of 1967, the following month, Jim Brown. 
uh, Lou Alcindor, now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. All them cats, Bill Russell, all go and meet with Ali in Cleveland and they back him. These men were hated. You understand? But the most hated Negro in America was Muhammad Ali. So Farrakhan's like, yes, brother, so how do you, you know that? He said, Muhammad Ali leaned up to him and said, still a nigga. What? <laughs> Farrakhan then said to the camera in the documentary, he says, still an N-word. Mm -hmm. That's what he asked him as he felt after he got that metal draped over his neck by the president of the United States. He said, still an what? But see, in this documentary-ish piece, you can't have Ali speak for himself. You let him speak for himself once about Malcolm at the very end through his daughter, but you couldn't repeat that. And by the way, if Farrakhan could be sitting on stage at Aretha Franklin funeral at her and her family's request, if he could be sitting there the same at Muhammad Ali's funeral, because you can't stop him because it would have been stopped. I'm not saying whether you support Louis Farrakhan or not. I'm saying that in these complicated histories and the governance structure, the social structure is not interested in that. And so I, I, I'll end with this just on this. So y'all, y'all go look at this thing for yourself. Because <laughs> Johnny Smith, who's the co-author of Blood Brothers, Johnny Smith comes in. Remember when Johnny Smith says, "You know, Muhammad Ali was uh, he he could not be more proud than to represent America." And then he went in the restaurant. And they mistreated him and he threw his medal. Why y'all be making it like, okay, so I was dumb my whole life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When Muhammad Ali beat George Foreman's ass in Zaire, part of the reason was when George Foreman won the gold medal at the 68 Olympics, when everybody was putting a life on the line, Tommy Smith and John Carlos appear in the trials of Muhammad Ali. Ain't none of that in this conversation. When when he he wore he wore, he waved that American flag around in the ring while Smith and Carlos put their fists up and Avery Brunch and them was trying to throw them boys and and women out of the Olympics. Foreman sided with the Americans, and part of that beautiful ass whipping that Muhammad Ali put on George Foreman in Africa was for that. Y'all go listen to uh, Buster Rhymes, Lauren Hill, Tribe Called Quest, Prize, Rumble in the Jungle on the soundtrack of When We Were Kings about the fight in Zaire. When you hear Buster Rhymes, who got some other kind of ideas on vaccines, we're going to leave that aside for a minute because as a rapper, I mean, the man, you know, is, is one of the greats, right? When he's in there, you know, he called George Foreman the targeted uncle. <laughs> in other words, Ali is hand out, but you can't put that in a documentary on called Blood Brothers where you're trying to freeze them. And let me end with this because there are all kind of other quotes we could talk about, but I'm going to leave all them other people alone because you got to demonize Islam just like they did on 9 11. You got to demonize all that. Um, Let's go to ways of knowing. The ways of knowing at the heart of that relationship really blossomed into black internationalism. Remember when. Uh, when uh, Zahir, Zahir Ali says, the guy who was working with Manny Mirable says, uh, uh, Ali saw, uh, Ali saw um, Malcolm X in Accra. I'm like, where's Accra? Oh, you mean Accra? You mean Accra, Ghana? Dude, really? You're an expert on Malcolm X and you don't know that you don't pronounce Accra. Accra that, that's Accra. You mean the capital of Ghana? Oh, I see. Okay. Where's Alice Wyndham, by the way? Alice Wyndham was Malcolm's friend. Alice Wyndham's still alive in St. Louis. My One of my elders, one of our elders, important. You know, you talk about Maya Angelou, that's safe. But did you read what my, in fact, let's not even read or talk about what anybody else said because, oh, come on, I want to end with this. Yes, Malcolm X. And then they talk about how February 14th, Malcolm's house was bombed, 1965. And you know the nation of Islam, but they were also with, and then they sneak in a little Cointel Pro because they know they can't just come with the same BS because everybody know in the governance structure, and you got to have some credibility. So you blacken it up just enough to keep a little bit of our attention, but you basically did a remake of Who Killed Malcolm X and a remake of Who's Why I Can't Wait to See What Ken Burns is going to Do with Ali. Uh, remember when they say they bombed his house, and then February fourteenth. And he came to Detroit anyway. This is the speech. Y'all can get anywhere. This is Malcolm X Speaks, one of the many collections. 
This is the speech after the bombing. And by the way, narrative folk know, you know, we got that list of black bookstores and narrative that's continued to grow. Support black businesses. Don't go buy this from Amazon. You just part of the social structure problem. Anyway, Malcolm starts that speech. Attorney Milton Henry, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies. And he goes on. It's that speech. Some of y'all heard that. Milton Henry, by the way, changed his name after the assassination of Malcolm X to Gaidi Obadeli, his brother, um, Imari Obadeli. These are two of the founders of the Republic of New Africa that we've talked about. This is why we have this speech, because they recorded it. But let me go something very quickly. He says, um, put it in the context of 9-11-2001. Malcolm says... He wants his freedom. And now he's talking about the Africans, the black people in Africa. Mind you, Malcolm says, the power structure is international and its domestic base is in London, in Paris, in Washington, D.C. and so forth. The outside or external phase of the revolution, which is manifest in the attitude and the action of the Africans today is troublesome enough. The revolution on the outside of the house or the outside of the structure is troublesome enough. But now. The powers that be are beginning to see that this struggle on the outside by the black is affecting, infecting the black who is on the inside of that structure. I hope you all understand what I'm trying to say. Pause. That documentary is a social American social structure trying to shrink Malcolm and Ali down to we're OK. We're OK. They found out we're OK and cut them off from the global analysis of power that was all Malcolm was about. And as Muhammad Ali grew in Islam, even before that, as a political figure, when he's giving talks and sitting around with people in Central Africa in Congo before he beats Foreman's ass because Foreman injured his hand and they had to postpone for several weeks, all of Ali's interviews are about internationalism. But you don't need all that for blood brothers because the blood you're trying to spill is ours to keep giving you these blood transfusions, but we don't have the same blood type, which was the whole point Malcolm was making. Let me fin finish this because let let's just get this out of the way in terms of white people. <laughs> this, is, you know, this is after he left the nation. Oh, he broke up. Muhammad, he's out. Then he went to Mecca, found out white people are cool. And if they, mm hmm watch this. Here's Malcolm. So y'all can go tell your children, bring the children. If you got them, they weren't listening. Bring them here. If y'all watching this later, pause, get your children. Listen, quote. Elijah Muhammad had taught us that the white man could not enter into Mecca and Arabia. And all of us who followed him, we believed it. When I got over there and went to Mecca, you know, I'll pause here just to say this is more complicated than what he's saying because Elijah Muhammad had been to Mecca, Malcolm. Anyway, so nothing. And saw these people who were blonde and blue eyed and pale skin and all those things. I said, well, but I watched them closely and I noticed that though they were white and they would call themselves white, there was a difference between them and the white ones over here. Oh, let's keep going. Oh, wait, this ain't 1963. Just a week before he's assassinated. So before y'all put words in the master teacher's mouth, as my friend Peter Bailey would say, y'all go read him. Because these people will have you believe in some shit ain't got nothing to do with Malcolm X. Let's continue. Malcolm says, and that basic difference was this. In Asia or the Arab world or in Africa where the Muslims are, if you find one who says he's white, all he's doing is using an adjective to describe something that's incidental about him. One of his incidental characteristics. There's nothing else to it. He's just white. But Malcolm says, but when you get the white man over here in America, and he says he's white, he means something else. You can listen to the sound of his voice. When he says he's white in a documentary, Muhammad Ali was the mascot. When he, he's saying he's white, that's really what he's saying. Malcolm says this. He says, you can listen to the sound of his voice. When he says he's white, he means he's boss. That's right. I didn't say that's right. He said that's right. Because he's watching these black. That's right. That's what white means in this language. You know the expression, free white in 21. He made that up. He's letting you know that white means free. Boss, he's up there so that when he says he's white, he has a little different sound in his voice. I know you know what I'm talking about. This is literally a governance conversation. He says, despite the fact that I know that Islam is a religion of brotherhood, I also have to face reality. And when I got back into this American society, I'm not in a society that practices brotherhood. I'm in a society that might preach it on Sunday, that might preach it on September 11, 2001, but they don't practice it on any 
other day. America is a society where there is no brotherhood. This society is controlled primarily by the racists and segregationists who are in Washington, D.C., in positions of power. And from Washington, D.C., they exercise the same forms of brutal oppression against dark skinned people in South and North Vietnam or in Congo or in Cuba or in Chile, September the 11th, 1973, or any other place on this earth where they are trying to exploit and oppress. Now, why don't you make a documentary where you stop Malcolm the day he had his house bomb and don't go to the very next day because your point you want to make is he forgave with you white people. He knew white people are not. Nah, Malcolm himself. Now I'm talking about them over there. You, when you say white, you mean boss. Critical race theory. Let me stop here. I, let me, I'll do one more quote. Here it is. He says this. He says, they, white people, took the burden completely off the society and put it right on the community by using the press to make it appear that the looting and all of this, because this is during the insurrections, Newark, others, 1963, 64, 65, Malcolm is killed in February 65. You see Watts blow up in August 1965. This is all going on here. He says, so he's talking about how they're characterizing black people. Take out this, put in Black Lives Matter. He says they took the burden completely off the society and put it right on the community by using the press to make it appear that the looting and all of this was proof that the whole act was nothing but vandals and robbers and thieves who weren't really interested in anything other than that, which was negative. Then he goes on to say that they use this to say, you know, they use statistics and say, oh, look at the black crime. Look at all the negative images. Look at all the things that are going on. And he says, then they export it internationally, Peace Corps, Operations Crossroads. And oh, oh yeah, I should, no, this is, I will. I'll stop here. I was gonna, I was gonna keep going, but y'all need to read that speech Malcolm gave on, or listen to the recording, February 15th, 1965, a week before he is assassinated, and Malcolm says this. They switched, think about capital letter I, capital letter C, international community. They switched from the old openly colonial imperialistic approach to the benevolent approach. Oh, we got to help these women in Afghanistan because Taliban going to press them. Can you help the women in Texas? Hell no. We got to get in power so we can help these women in Afghanistan. Anyway. They came up. <laughs> they came up with some benevolent colonialism, philanthropic colonialism, oh, humanitarianism, or dollarism. This is Malcolm a week before he's assassinated. Nowhere in Blood Brothers. I'm sorry. Nowhere in Blood Brothers. All right. <laughs> Immediately, everything was Peace Corps, Operation Crossroads. We've got to help our African brothers. Pick up on that, Malcolm says. He says, pick up on that. Can't help us in Mississippi. Can't help us in Alabama or Detroit or out here in Dearborn. He's in Dearborn, Michigan, where some real Ku Klux Klan lives. They're going to send all the way to Africa to help. Malcolm says, I know Dearborn, you know. I'm from Detroit. I used to live out in Inkster and you had to go through Dearborn to get to Inkster, just like driving through Mississippi when you got to Dearborn. It is. Is it still that way? Well, you should straighten that out. And he goes on to say, this is what they do. They're not interested in helping. No, there's somebody at my door, but that's all right. There's nobody that can help you. Maybe that's uh, them coming. No, no, <laughs> no, it cannot be. It cannot be. Well, they can't. They can't stop. We talking about Malcolm saying, you know, "I got some for him. I got. I got to welcome." Okay, thank you. Uh, say, say less, Doctor Carr. Um, in that documentary, two other things that stood stood out. That I just wanted to, you know, because please, we, we please, find, yeah. find nuggets in all things, right? So, first all thing right. that I hadn't known was that in that Liston fight, which no one thought Muhammad Ali was going to win, that Cassius Clay was going to well, win. Well, he thought he was going to win. He, well, <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't, I think Malcolm oh. thought he could win and encouraged, and you know, because they were saying that they prayed together right before, and he told him, "In that ring with you is not just Allah, you know, not just you." Allah's in that ring with you, and you're not just fighting by yourself. Mm -hmm. and that carried him forward. But Malcolm X was sitting in row seven, seat number seven. I you thought about you. No, I thought about you. You know, I thought about you. You know, I wrote that down. <laughs> and, you know, Wasn't that something? From mosque number seven. What is Mosque that? seven, seat seven, row seven, and couldn't pick them other sevens. So that. and, and the Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You want to sit with that? That's three sevens, right? That's 21, right? That is. I don't know. What did Raquel say? I take seven NCs, put them in a line, add seven more brothers that think they can rhyme, and then I, I'll add seven more before I go for mine, and that's 20 M on NCs, eight up at the same time. <laughs> this is three sevens. I ain't think about that. Miles number seven. That's right. 
and and um finally i just want to point out the courage you know a lot of folk uh name themselves or got into their names you were even talking about you know name that's on your birth certificate that muhammad ali could stand in that courage at that time wow. 64 neither one of us were born yet but you know that the world was on fire racially leave dr carlone he'll get to the uh, in a minute I want to hear this. yes but, but that that he was able to accept that Muhammad Ali name in a time when this country really was just on, on fire racially, that he sat in that, that he that he was courageous enough to, to own that name and to walk into it. I just thought that at 21 was really powerful. And there's a lot of courageous people, a lot of young people right now doing things that, um, you know, uh, we should celebrate. That's all. I just wanted to take that as one thumbs up. Um, we also have, um, I'm going to be taking questions exclusively from Nubia. So we're going to just take one question if we Real can. Question. Could you get them? I know, I know what that is. They got to move. They okay. can't leave at the door. I'm going to go get it and come right back. Uh, I'm going right, right here. Let me take Dr. Carr, uh, move him from the stream for a second. Hello, Leon in Nubia. Uh, Hello, Professor Hunter. Can you hear me? Yeah. Why'd you turn out your light though? <laughs> uh, actually, I just turned it back on. I don't know. It's, um, it's the laptop. Okay, all right, because we, we got dark all of a sudden. Well, well I know I did. I don't uh, know. And for all of the folk uh, who are in Nubia, hello, uh, thank you. Uh, we are only going to be taking questions from Nubia moving forward um, because you know, and and we're going to be having office hours uh, during the week. Uh, Dr. Carr is committed to that, so we're going to be doing some impromptu live classes in which we can engage more. Well, he's going to engage more because this, this is his class, not mine. Yes, it is. Um, not not only, but your class too, Professor. Hey, hey, no question, it's our class. Right. <laughs> but so, y'all come on, join newbie because we, man, we be getting it in in there, man. Oh, hey, that Michael Williams. Whew. I appreciate that last week. That allowed us. Anyway, go ahead. How All you right. doing, Leon? Hey, Leon? How you doing, Dr. Carr? Fine. Uh, Professor, I asked where you from. Oh, I'm from Pennsylvania. Oh, what part? Uh, about two and a half hours north of Philadelphia. Uh, near the Poconos? No. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know I'm Philly man, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I I I follow you on Twitter and everything. I admire. Oh, yeah. And um, appreciate you, Bob. Roland Martin, Roland Martin show. Oh man, it's. Oh. I just yeah. love how I just love how you just throw out those breadcrumbs and connect the dots and. Appreciate You're like a sleuth. <laughs> well, we, we together, brother. We crowdsource and knowledge because okay. we are the source of our knowledge. So we, I'm glad to be a brother in there with you, man. All right. I do have a couple questions, but I don't know what. I mean, we we kind of hit a lot of different topics in, yeah. in this whole two and a half hour deal. Right, so, um, can I talk question. about the Leon, Leon? Ask one question. Keep it. I tight. will. All right. Okay. okay he's going. He, 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 no, there was a lot. No, there was just a lot of topics hit. Um, yes. Can yeah. I, can I talk about the um, how Merrick Garland stepped up to talk about the um, Roe versus Wade down in uh, Texas? Oh yeah, of course. Of All course. right. Um, my question is to you. I know since you have a law a law background as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of funny. Is how <clears throat> all of a sudden this administration they're going to have um, um, I'm the, um, Attorney General Garland step up and talk about. Um, women's right to choose, which is nothing wrong. That's very important. But also, it just seems like they overlooked uh, the voter rights and uh, the um, the voter rights and uh, hold on. I, I just all written down. <laughs> Trust me. All right. That's all right. All right I, I, think, uh, I think I know where you're going with it, but let's 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 play this out. Let's play this out. Okay. Go ahead. So you you, you, you talking about the other things that they could have uh, emphasized. Stepped up. Yeah, stepped up. Uh, there should be some legality to the voter rights and the um, even like the the George Floyd police uh, bill, and um, it just it just seemed like they cherry pick. I mean, yeah. that's that's how I see it. They yeah. kind of just picked that one topic, but there was a couple other topics they could have um, that the AG could have stepped up. Right, that she had some type of legality basis on why some of these states are um, running these um, well atrocious bills. I think I think what we're faced with is. It's, pol it's, it's, it's a political decision. They don't want... Okay, let's, let's pause here and think about this. We are in September 2021. We are in... We aren't in... The, we haven't really ramped up yet campaigns for Congress. They're hoping to hold on to the House of Representatives and maybe get 
a few more seats in the Senate. Probably not going to happen. Um, in part because the White Nationalist Party is very uh, motivated, even though now they, they, they're telling me that uh, I think it's is it three to one for mail in ballots or return ballots in the California recall election. California has uh, closer to a democracy probably anywhere in the country, but that means that a minority of people can trigger a recall of the governor. And they have a real white nationalist candidate who is running uh, in the recall. And all the white nationalists have to do is get a candidate who has uh, a majority of the votes of the many people running if they can recall the governor, uh, Gary uh, Newsom, Gavin Newsom. Uh, the white nationalist who is leading now is a black dude named uh, Larry Elder, a real piece of work. Um, who is out in California. So, you know, that isn't that doesn't play on the national stage. But if he is some kind of way elder comes to governor of California, you're going to see a real disaster and people going to scream bloody murder. And all my friends who say the, all the parties are the same and voting doesn't matter. We talked about that last year, of course. Uh, we, Professor Hunter, we had that conversation. Uh, of course it does, because that's where we are, where we are with this tech, new Texas law that the Supreme Court of the United States literally uh, turned their back on the Constitution, five of them. As Sonia Sotomayor said in her dissent, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But the reason they haven't gone for voting rights is it's political. And by that, I mean, they don't have the numbers to get the uh, legislation, voting rights fixes in uh, the hands of the president of the United States to sign into law. And so I expect that they will file voting rights lawsuits, but they the decision on whether or not to go ahead with some form of going into the courts is being influenced partially by the political wing, the strategists who are saying, OK, if we if we file all these lawsuits, are we going to trigger a white lash among the white nationalists who are already fired up? Meanwhile, those people who voted for the Democratic Party, particularly black and brown people, particularly black people are saying we voted for y'all to do that. But again, they're counting heads. Uh, you, you know, sometimes political scientists refer to this as electoral capture. The idea is y'all ain't got nowhere else to go but the Democratic Party in a two-party system. And until there's more than a two-party system, you got to stay with us for the time being so we can ignore you or keep forestalling you. But they're running the risk that that might turn into apathy. You see, so all these political calculations. Meanwhile, Merrick Garland, who ain't never been no champion of black people, that's why Barack Obama uh, nominated him for the Supreme Court. Here's a white man that y'all kind of kind of agrees with y'all on a few things. He's a moderate, you know, Barack Obama, again, one of his many mistakes made with this fundamental misreading of where he lives, where he was born and raised, and his belief in something that doesn't exist, namely the American people, this aspirational concept, thinking you can make a peace offering to people for whom your very presence at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is a uh, is an offense to their God and to their notion of nation. You can't make no peace offering. So milk toast okay. merit. But, but Doc, can yeah. we blame can we blame anyone, you know, for believing in something we've been indoctrinated into believing? No, we can't blame them if they don't know better. But he knows right. better. You think he knows better? Of course he does. I think he believes it. I'm thinking, and that's why I'm saying I ain't criticizing him. I'm just pointing out this guy believes it, and his beliefs gonna get us killed. Why? Because instead of nominating a black woman for that seat and triggering and daring these white nationalists to go public at that time with what they had gone public with the night of his election, when that conf unreconstructed Confederate senator from Kentucky sat in Washington, D.C. at a restaurant and said, my job is to make him a one-term president. We won't agree with nothing. Damn everything. Social policy network. We don't care. Instead of him stepping into that after several years, what does he do? He makes another offering, which means you ain't stupid. You just believe it. Yeah, but couldn't he think that in offering up Merrick Garland, somebody who had passed muster all of those same senators had already voted to approve him to go through. Yes. Was it in his strategically thinking I could get this through because you guys already vetted and approved him. Yes. So at least I can get my Supreme Court pick. He didn't where he miscalculated, I think, was the level and the length to which these people were willing to be hypocrites. They didn't give a damn about what it looked like. They were not going to let him I do agree. it. He thought I agree. this would at least be a black woman was definitely going to be a fight. 
Well, well, no, but but that's the whole. That's what I'm saying. I agree right, with no, you. But, but he, he miscalculated the power miscalculated. Of, of us too, because had you put a black woman up, it'd have been all you know. Donnie Brooke, Katie barred the door, right? Ready to, ready to fight with you, right? But had no leg to stand on because I give a damn about Merrick Garland then or now. And that's the whole point, right? I mean, that's what I'm saying. If okay. he had not made a black woman, and they had done the same thing to her that they did to Merrick Garland. Who would have won the election in November? You're right. Hillary Clinton. No question. Because black women would say, I hate Hillary Clinton. And I'm voting for her because she on campaign trail said, when I'm in, I'm swing I'm nominating her again. In other words, Barack Obama's miscalculation is based on the same arc of miscalculations he's made his entire public career after he got in the United States Senate. Which, by the way, contradicts enough of his pre-electoral politics rhetoric, at least when he was in Chicago and needed them black people, that put him in a position to run for Senate in the first place. Which means probably when you read like, and again, this is, uh, to me, this is the best book on Obama, not because it's the best written. This is the massive tome called Rising Star, The Making of Barack Obama, David Garrow. This book is including index 1,460 pages long. It's a tome. The reason I like this book is because it seemed like David Garrow tracked down everybody Barack Obama ever knew. Auto girlfriends, all his law school classmates and interviewed them all a couple of times and put and then didn't even try to edit. Just put just dump the transcript in one place. And what you see is Obama, like a lot of people, is constantly figuring out how will this advance whatever it is at the core I want. Even at law school. And, and so I think you're absolutely right. And I think he miscalculated. You're absolutely right about that. And so what we have, in, and so Joe Biden is Barack Obama, except there's something added to Joe Biden Barack Obama could never have. And he knows he couldn't have. That is the thing Malcolm was talking about. I'm boss. I'm white. Meaning what? Because remember when Obama was running against him in the primaries the first time, Joe Biden thought he was giving him a compliment and came out with that Delaware racism. He's the first bright, clean, articulate black candidate to run. And I'm looking at you like, man, if I had to listen to somebody for two hours, it wouldn't be Barack Obama if my only choices were Barack Obama and Jesse Jackson. What you mean by articulate? Oh, you mean white sounding. I got you. But my point, my point is this. When Biden got in there, Biden, I'm one of you. So come on, y'all. Okay, your naivete is cut out of that same cloth of white nationalism. I get that. Ron Walters led us through that years ago. But then you appoint Merrick Garland in part because you think you can push Merrick Garland and plus y'all politics are a little bit closer together. But then you also have nominated Vanita Gupta, Kristen Clark. Now you got two non-white women who are on the record pushing, including the African uh, Kristen Clark, whose people are from Jamaica as well, and Vanita Gupta, who was, you know, the Alicia Conference of Civil Rights. And Now, I'm sure in the internal meetings, them two sisters is giving Mary Garland hell about voting rights. Garland has not advanced voting rights in part, I am certain, because the political operatives in the Biden White House have said it's not yet time because I think maybe a few of them are still chasing them three toothless white voters and, right. and they, who they think going to come back at some point and vote for them. And that's the same type of miscalculation that the yeah, I was going to say, as they, as they, as they continue to st be strategic, they're going to strategize themselves right out of office and we're going to, and us, and us, and, and us, yeah. with the deal. that's and, right. And, 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 uh, Nene uh, SW in Nubia, because there's a chat in there. By the way, which is you say? Vastly, you say? vastly different than the chat on YouTube. Oh, this and is it, good. <laughs> she said, uh, "No, he miscalculated the gentleman in the gentleman's agreement," and I think that that is true too. Ooh. Like I think when we get in, I think uh, Vice President Kamala Harris needs to be careful of this as well. You know, you get into this position of power and you uh, make the mistake that you are part of the the system. The, that, that system. Right. And, and, and that you can do something. I'm glad she said that. Let me respond to that right quick, Professor Hunter, because it reminded me again, thinking about Philadelphia again, Wilson Good, the mm -hmm. former the former mayor of Philadelphia. And of course, we passed again uh, this summer, the, the, the anniversary of the bombing of Osage Avenue, uh, the MOVE group. And many of the MOVE folks still political prisoners. Um, and we talked, we saw how the University of Pennsylvania, shout out to the white institutions that had the bones of 
uh, some of the victims of move the children in their collection. And they say, oh, we didn't know we, we were trying. OK, whatever. You know what I'm saying? But Wilson Good was the mayor of Philadelphia. And to this day, there are people who say Wilson Good, the black mayor, dropped a bomb on those black people in West Philly. That's true and not true, because what he never had control of in reality was the police, the safety commissioner, and then white boys decided to kill those black people, shooting up in the house, dropping bombs, burn up blocks out there. And Wilson Good says to this day, because he's still alive, still living in Philly, you know, in fact, he wrote his memoir. I got it over there. You know, it was a mistake. He should have exerted himself. You don't get off the hook, but to what you just raised with regard, with regard to the vice president, there's elected office and there's power. Hmm. And even the mayor of the city of Philadelphia couldn't stop them white boys because he didn't push back enough to stop them from doing what they wanted to do, which was hunt. That's what these police forces do. They're hunting. So whether it be Lori Lightfoot in Chicago, whether it be Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta, you can't stop these hunters. They're going to hunt. And some of them look like you. But when, when the reason I thought about Philly at that moment wasn't even that backstory. It was the phrase that she used in Nubia, gentleman's agreement. There was an agreement in Philadelphia. They called it the gentleman's agreement. That, And if you all know the city of Philadelphia, up until the last 30 years or so, when you come to Philly, you see downtown Philadelphia, the tallest building you could see was City Hall. And at the top of City Hall, there's a statue of William Penn. They had a William Penn. They had a gentleman's agreement that said nobody, any construction uh, project in this area around what they call Center City, Philadelphia, no building can be taller than William Penn's hat because we like this old, they, 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 Philadelphia likes to pretend it has a kind of Latin flavor to it too, a kind of old, old Europe flavor. So they wanted the downtown to be. Wilson Good was the mayor that broke the gentleman's agreement by authorizing and pushing through city council the authorization to build the first tower that was taller than William Penn's head. And now when you go into Philly, they got a Comcast center, the thing is gone. At the time, they asked in reports, what about the gentleman's agreement? William, uh, what about the general gen gentleman's agreement in William Penn's hat and the, to, the, the top of City Hall? Wilson Good's response, and I quote, which is what Obama should have known. I ain't no gentleman. <laughs> that's, that's the end. Of it. So yeah. until we understand that the only people in an agreement in this society with these people are them with each other. We're going to keep getting punched in the face. And on that, um, at Lee in Nubia, uh, Carlos wanted to know, because uh, he was in briefly, should, and he wants to ask you, uh, should more Black folk join law enforcement to help expose the corruption of the white power structure? I've talked about this quite frequently on my radio show. What do you what think? Thoughts? Um, what would you tell us? When I first got on the air, you know, on the heels of Mike Brown and 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 the, <laughs> the seemed like a domino of Black uh, people being killed by police. Uh, my my thought was a clarion call for all of us. First of all, to go get a gun license because that would that would shift and change some things. But also to join uh, the police in mass. But like the way the Urban League infiltrated corporate America, like with a, mm -hmm. a group of people that could you know train together, uh, you know take the test together, you know come in not just one or two but in mass. Uh, these major police forces in particular, you know, Chicago, places where we are under siege constantly and join as a group with a purpose. Yes. That's what I thought could happen. But there's doesn't seem to be any organization willing to do that work to train to make sure that they're. I, I think that's tough because, as you know, I mean, having interacted with uh, folk for many years and talk with them, listen to them, um, Noble, you know, the, the Black police officers associate one of the black police officers association um what's the name of the one there in new york area i think eric adams was in it yeah he was a uh, hundred blacks in law enforcement who care he marked right. um they, which is ironic now that he might be mayor of new york i'm like hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well this is the answer right i mean th this is the conversation the, in other words, th there is no one answer in the middle of a traffic stop 
when they got you and you thinking this may be the last breath and everybody standing on the curb with the damn phones up going to create you as the next star on trauma porn. Do you want one of the people who pulls up in a cruiser after they stop you to be a black woman? I'm thinking even on the off chance. Yeah. Now, that don't mean that she going to break ranks, but with the proper, let me not, I'm not speaking aspirational. This is all a gamble with maybe with the proper training. And by, by that, I mean from birth. I don't mean no. no plans training. Training. Okay. Yeah, he's a trained to hunt. Like you yeah, said. Exactly. And these people are attracted to the profession because they have the predisposition, whether, you know, I mean, they didn't get hugs as a child or, you know, you know, whatever. So their boyfriend or girlfriend dumped them when they was 10 years old. And now they just going to get revenge. I mean, all them types get drawn in. So the protector types, the people we're talking about are in there, too, but they're overmatched. So do you want to go try to get some of those people in there? Absolutely. However, that's only one piece of a multi-pronged strategy because people say, don't be talking about defund the police. Okay. Defund the police. Who are you? Do y'all remember Malcolm X? One of, one of the beefs Malcolm had in the nation was we're not involved in politics. So when you make a documentary, Blood Brothers and these other Malcolm documentaries, you say he broke with the nation because you know, it was about the whiteness and Mecca. No, he kept his political beliefs when he wasn't in the nation of Islam. And one of the things that freedom get up to do, in fact, you know what? Let him say it. Yeah, let's let him say it. That's right. Let's let him say it after the bombing. Let me see if I can find it quickly because he makes this comment about the NAACP. Watch this. Malcolm says, for one thing, the, one of the primary ingredients in the complete, watch this, I love this. All y'all scholars who claim y'all, this is the first reading of Malcolm X. No, go read Malcolm. You ain't even writing no damn book. Just read what he wrote or what he said. But one thing, one of the primary ingredients in what Malcolm calls the, pol the complete civil rights struggle, there's the phrase, was the Black Muslim movement. Huh? The Black Muslim movement took no part in things political. Civic, it didn't take too much part in anything other than stopping people from doing this drinking, smoking, and so on. Moral reform it had. But beyond that, it did nothing. But it talked such a strong talk that it put the other Negro organizations on the spot. Before the Black Muslim movement came along, the NAACP was looked at upon as radical. Then they were getting, they were getting ready to investigate it. And then along came the Muslim movement and frightened the white man so hard that he began to say, thank God for old Uncle Roy and Uncle Whitney and Uncle A. Philip and Uncle, you got a whole lot of uncles in there. I can't remember their names. They're all older than I, so I call them uncle. See, Malcolm joking, right? <laughs> he said, plus, if you use the word Uncle Tom nowadays, I hear they can sue you for libel, you know. So I don't call any of them uncle anymore. I call them Uncle Roy. But the point is this. <laughs> who are you outside? I'm somebody who believes all the damn police need to be gotten rid of, okay? And who are you marching in the street next to him? I'm somebody that prays that some of y'all crackers run up in my house in the middle of the night, because unlike uh, Breonna Taylor and her boyfriend, I don't sleep and I got all my guns aimed at the door. When y'all coming? <laughs> Wait, hold on. All y'all together? Yeah, we don't even agree with each other, but we all agree on one thing. This year right here gonna stop. So now in the locker room, as they taking off their body armor, Here's the black woman, the Latinx or the black man saying, see, look, I'm going to tell y'all hillbilly something. Now, you wouldn't even say that six months ago. But as this solidarity movement moves outside of the thing, these black people who feel that way inside are emboldened. Y'all going to stop this shit right here. It ain't going to be no more damn traffic stops. I'm not I'm not answering the call. Today. Well, why are you talking like that? I wouldn't have talked like this until I realized that these people have had enough. What Malcolm is saying is that there is a multi-pronged effort. So no, hiring all black people or all brown people on the police, that ain't gonna fix it. But if you do it with some of the right people while you're doing all the rest of it, and then some of those people who say, I don't never vote, do. I ain't telling you to lead a strap. I'm saying, go on a register and, and then tomorrow we'll keep doing what you're doing. We're gonna train at the dojo. We're gonna do all that. And let's run this uh, young brother over here. Let's run this sister over here. Let's go vote. Okay, but we start fighting as if there's a silver bullet. It ain't that, it's this. It ain't that, it's this. Uh -uh. Right. 
Malcolm, Malcolm trying to tell y'all one of the problems he had with the nation. Well, we talking about Elijah Muhammad and the babies and, and the women. No, one of the problems he had with the nation is we got to take the gloves off. But even Malcolm said a week before he died, even though the nation didn't take the gloves off, just what we was talking. <laughs> just what we was talking. We should be given some credit for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Not because we were lobbying Congress. Remember that picture of Martin and Malcolm? That picture of Martin and Malcolm is taken when Malcolm is in the United States Capitol. Because remember, his friend is Adam Clayton Powell listening to the debate of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That's the reason they had that picture. They were both in D.C. at the same day in the chambers listening to the debate. Mm. So, you know, don't just take that as a picture that Roger Guinevere Smith held up to do the right thing. Ma -ma -ma Malcolm, Ma -ma -ma -ma. no, 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 no. Look at the c -c -c context and understand that that's not just a picture that represents this philosophy. And let's stop just saying there's, there's no one silver bullet. And there's all we need all hands on deck. So yes. even the lesson from you know uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad being threatened by the power that Malcolm like there are gonna be people that are gonna be in your space all the time. Let them be in your space. It's not yours. All the time. Well, Elijah Muhammad had, you're right about that. Yeah. I think I think they're right about that in terms of Elijah Muhammad. But again, documentary-ish. Mm. Why did you pull that out to make that the theme? Because you don't want to talk about the structural issues. This is all about white forgiveness, even the blacks. Sorry, bro. If it's not true, come back on with Professor Hunter and explain yeah. it to her. Because all I'm seeing is white forgiveness. <laughs> and maybe he didn't know. So uh, I'm going to give him grace. Yeah, uh, he, got, he got Bob Marley in there. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Okay. If he was in the room when he, if he edited the film, <laughs> he, I mean, I try to give people grace too, but shit, you got you got Bob in there with Garvey spirit and Garvey son. If you don't know then, that's willful ignorance. You don't get no pass. Or you get a pass, don't make no more uh, documentaries. And yeah, and go tell your mans, Blackish is tired. Um, all right, that was said. That's Dr. Greg Carr <laughs> in class. Uh, and today, September 11th, again, we want to pay a homage to the people who lost their lives, family no members. No question. We have family members, uh, you know, who life is precious. No question. Especially, Professor, especially the people who were already on the margins. Because we both know those people. The people selling flowers who don't have no papers. The people who were in the subway trying to fill up that coffee cup with chains so they could go get breakfast. Those people died too. And so while we talk about the first responders, we talk about the people who worked in the building, all, all life is equally precious, including those people who were who were invisible before the towers fell. So yes, absolutely. And also on this day, uh, James Charles Evers, born in 1922 in Decatur, Mississippi, on this day. Charles Evers. <laughs> oh, I got, hey, look, we gotta, look, we're gonna have to do some more on Emmett Till. Cause you see how they slipped Emmett Till? Come on. Don't be, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> don't do that. Don't, anyway, that's a whole nother story. Actually, this week in my law school class, we are reading Catherine Frankie's book, Repair on Reparations. And we're focusing on Davis Bend, Mississippi, where during the Civil War, the Union Army basically made a deal with the enslaved Africans on Jefferson Davis's brother Ben's plantation to, uh, they basically ran the plantation, ran a profit making cotton that paid for partially the Freedmen's Bureau. But after the war was over, of course, the United States government social structure returned the land to the damn Confederates who owned it. And the son of the brother that ran the plantation for Davis then left and started an all black town called Mound Bayou, Mississippi. And of course, Mount Bayou is where TRM Howard was. And TRM Howard's house is where Emmett Till's mother, Mamie, would spend the night during the trial. And I'm just saying all that to say that um, when you put Emmett Till's face up, as we know, that story is much bigger than that. But you but you don't need all that in the social structure. All you want is the picture so you can weave together a beautiful pair of earrings, a nice hat, maybe a little necklace or something on white nationalism. So... <sighs> All right. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Listen, I'll see you uh, during class time. Uh, you know, yes. office hours uh, next week in Nubia. And uh, thanks, y'all. This and, is and this shirt you can get right now on in get the Nubia joint. Yeah, this is just my. I just put this. I had this on. These are my um, people. Oh, ask me about it. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, I had this one on because this is uh this is Dunbar High School. These my these my young cats. Uh, Nubia Green and them, Holly Green's daughter, and the, and the Carter G. Woodson Black Studies Academy. So all these people either taught at Dunbar or went to Dunbar. But y'all yeah. better come on in. Y'all see how we do? Learn, create, grow. And now Nubia has been launched. Happy birthday to you! Yeah. <laughs> All right. Listen, thank you, uh, everyone, wherever you are in the world. That's why we say, you know, morning, afternoon, evening, because we're global. The oh, yeah. Studies classroom in the world. Yeah. Oh, and uh, thank you all. Yes, they're talking about the people who died in the crash. Spike does a good job on that. The uh, flight attendants to pass. Somebody said it's a middle school kid from D.C. Flight number 93? No, no, the one that crashed into the Pentagon. Oh. Yeah, my cousin, my cousin, in fact, works at the Pentagon. Where she, my cousin from Alabama, my mom's side. But somebody, Seahorn, says some middle school kids from D.C. area going to a science fair also died. They were on the plane that crashed at the Pentagon. Yeah, there were there were what one, two, three, four planes crashed, and all those people died. Yeah, and and, and yeah, so yeah, and shout out to the, the the people who weren't on the planes who were part of that family in the air, the black ones, and they call them the Soul Patrol. I never knew about the Soul Patrol until I saw all the all the flight attendants and pilots. Like <laughs> Lee for doing that too. Yeah, for real. Yeah, yeah. No question. All right, y'all. Love you too. Talk to.